This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below. Chapter 61, The Break-In at A.I.D. Eddie and Quinn headed towards the History of Magic classroom to attend another history lecture by Cuthbert Binns, the Professor Ghost of Hogwarts. What are we going to study? Asked Quinn, I stopped listening to him months ago. Hmm, ah, today we are going to learn about one of the goblin leaders, answered Eddie. Trying to remember topics for today's lecture, I can't recall the name. It was something followed by a weapon. That brought a chuckled out Quinn, isn't that most of them? Why does Hogwarts let Professor Binns teach after his death, wondered Eddie, he clearly had an obsession with goblins. I mean, look at his classes, he rushes through anything that isn't goblin related and spends most of his time on the goblin rebellions. Quinn thought about the reasoning and could only come up with reasoning. Hogwarts is a school. Professors are its employees, so maybe, they keep letting Binns teach because they don't need to pay him. A ghost doesn't have the use of money. Plus, as far as I know, no law states that ghosts need to be paid. Quinn nodded as he looked at Eddie. Yeah, I guess that is it. So, money is the reason, huh? Eddie held his chin with his hand. Never thought about that. Maybe you are right. Quinn bumped Eddie with his shoulder and spoke. Maybe before we graduate from Hogwarts, we would exorcise Professor Binns and save the future generation from boredom incarnate. Eddie wagged his finger in disagreement. And, take away the one hour of practically free time from them? I don't think so. Hmm, maybe you are right, laughed Quinn. After a while, everything Bin speaks turns into white background noise. Exactly. Eddie and Quinn laughed as they entered the history of magic classroom. Scene break. Ivy Potter and Hermione Granger walked at a fair distance away from Quinn West, following him, tailing their prime suspect. Both girls watched Quinn and his friend laughing and joking around like it was any other day. Ivy grabbed Hermione's arms when they reached the corridor with the history of magic classroom and hurriedly whispered, as soon as the class starts, we are going to run to the A.I.D classroom. Hermione nodded and hid behind a pillar, waiting for the class to start so that they could sneak into the A.I.D classroom turned office. Do you know what is behind the glass wall in there? Asked Hermione as they waited. Ivy shook her and replied, I tried to ask around, but nobody knows what is behind the glass. Everybody has only ever seen the office part. Both she and Hermione had only been to the A.I.D office once, but they clearly remembered the glass wall. The glass was heavily frosted, so not much visible through the wall panel. Maybe we would find something in there, said Ivy, there was a door built into the wall, so we know there is something in there. She was anxious about what they were about to do. The polyjuice plan didn't cause her this much anxiety because they knew Draco was an idiot. But Quinn West? He was an entirely different ballgame. Quinn West was a smart person. Ivy could still remember the first time he had warned them about the stone's defenses or when he refused to admit that he had been in the chambers, even though he clearly knew what was inside. When he caught her, Quinn West exactly knew what he was doing. His words and demeanor reflected his end goal, and that was to bring her under his debt, which he succeeded in doing without breaking a beat. There always had been a sense of mystery around Quinn West, and today would be the day she would remove the curtain of the mystery away from him. Ivy, let's go, she heard Hermione speak, the class has started. Hermione's words snapped Ivy out of her thoughts. She looked at the empty corridor and could hear the faint sound of Bin droning about goblins and one of the early rebellions. Let's go. Scene break. Eddie and Quinn sat side by side, a deck of mini cards spread on the table in front of them. The cards were regularly sized, but Quinn had shrunk them to fit on the somewhat narrow table. The two boys played the game, concentration, matching pairs, match-match, match-up, memory, pelminism, shinkei sojaka, pexiso, or anything you wanted to call the game. The game was simple, all the cards were laid face down on the table, and two cards were flipped face up over each turn. The object of the game is to turn over pairs of matching cards. You know you never win this game, whispered Quinn, yet, you still challenge me to this every so often. Why is that? You do know that we can play something else instead. He had his cheek resting on his palm, with his elbow on the table, looking like a standard laid-back fellow. One day, I will win against you, said Eddie, flipping over two similar cards, gaining a point for himself, and when that day comes, victory will be that much sweeter. Oh, Merlin, it will be glorious, and you will rue the day. A low scoff came from Quinn before he spoke, the only way you can beat me at this to drug me till I am doozy and then challenge me. He turned a pair of similar cards and gained a point, followed by another identical pair, gaining yet another point for himself. Yeah, that is my last option, my plan Z is to speak, spoke Eddie as he hovered his hand over the cards, deciding which one to flip, if I don't win till we are in our seventh year, I am going to hand you the dessert you like with tons of potion mixed in and then challenge you to a game. Quinn stared at his friend with stunned silence, that won't be a genuine victory, you know. So, it is your fault. Who told you to be so good at this game? Scene break. Ivy and Hermione reached the west corner corridor of the fifth floor. This hallway was where the A.I.D office lived, right on the main corridor, so it was easy to find. The two girls stood in front of the door to the classroom turned office. They stared at it for a few seconds before Hermione took action. She took out her wand and pointed it at the door lock, Alohomora, the whisper of the incantation left her mouth accompanied by an invisible spell light to the door lock. 
Hermione's eye twitched when the door didn't unlock. She turned to Ivy and spoke, he has charmed it against the unlocking spell. She bit her lower lip, just like Professor Flitwick did in the stone's defenses. I thought he might do that, so, the redhead put her hands in her robe pocket and revealed the key in her head, I swiped the key from Filch's key hoop. He has keys to all the rooms in the castle. The redhead, green-eyed Potter looked proud as she inserted the key into the lock hole and turned it to unlock the door. There was a click before the lock released the door from its bindings. She held the doorknob and looked at Hermione before pushing the door to enter inside. Scene break. Inside the history of magic classroom, Quinn inhaled a deep breath and sat up straight in his chair, his eye wide open as he stared straight ahead. The ward on the front door of his office triggered itself. Someone had opened just opened the front door and entered his office. It was a simple sensory ward used on doors and entrances that warned the caster if someone opened the door and entered. The ward was simple to cast and had a simple yet elegant function, plus the ward had an added hidden ability which made it moderately problematic to detect. Of course, it did have its disadvantages, the ward once found was easy to dismantle or bypass without the caster's knowledge. But that didn't matter right now because, with a flash of red on his nape, Quinn felt anger building inside him as someone had just broken into his office. Quinn didn't know who it was, but that didn't matter. He hadn't done anything to warrant a spot check from the professors if the intruder was a faculty member. They had no proper justification for going through his stuff. This was the better scenario because he couldn't do anything drastic against the professors. But, if it was not a faculty member, which meant it was a student. And if the intruder was indeed a student, then they didn't know what was good for them. Cause there was a f-ing storm going to rain down on their bloody heads. The red on Quinn's deepened as he thought about the intruder in his office. I have to know who it is, fumed Quinn. He needed to get out of here. Neither the office nor the workshop had currently any defenses set up that stopped people from going in if they really tried to break in. He had removed the shock on the doorknob because he was afraid that someone would get shocked while he was not in the office and it might get the professors involved. Even though the A.I.D cards clearly stated if he has in or out of the office, the reality wasn't so ideal and people still showed up when he was not in. And, around a month ago, he was feeling especially sleepy while he working in the workshop, so he just left for the night by locking the door. Ever since then there had been no magical defenses on the workshop door. Plus, this was a first, no one actually tried to break into his workshop since the time he opened shop, so he might have been lax on security. Even though there was nothing in the workshop other than some files, he still wanted to go there right now. He looked to his side at Eddie and whispered, I am not feeling well. I am going to the hospital wing. Now, asked Eddie as they were in the middle of a class. Quinn nodded as he packed his book bag and spoke, yeah, I am going right now. See you later. He stood up and directly spoke to Bins. Professor Bins, I am not feeling well. I am going to the hospital wing. The ghost of a professor looked at Quinn before nodding. No more words were spoken as Quinn briskly walked outside of the classroom. As soon as Quinn was out, he immediately pulled out Recon and activated it while walking. Fifth floor, west corner, main corridor. Quinn spoke with raging heat behind his words. Red flashed on his nape. The Hogwarts tracking map immediately obeyed its master's orders, and the ink on the fabric shifted to show the precise location that Quinn had specified. With a look from Quinn, the map zoomed and honed on the A.I.D office, and the second he saw two blue dots on the map in his office, his feet stopped, and he came to a halt. Blue dot meant that the person on the map was a student. Quinn stared at the text tags above the two blue dots, and his gaze turned into a glare, his face twisting into a fierce expression before every expression drained from his face. It wasn't a clemency that took expressions away from his face, the look on Quinn's face was an expression of ice-cold anger. Recon showed two names, Ivy Potter and Hermione Granger. Scene break. Ivy and Hermione looked around the office area of the classroom, and the room was dark with no windows to provide light to the room. Hermione looked up at the ceiling with her wand raised but saw that there were no chandeliers with ever-burning candles on the roof. There are no chandeliers on the roof, she said as her wand tip lit up, use the Lumos charm. Ivy took out her wand, and her wand tip lit up after a murmur of the incantation. In the light from the two glowing tips of wands, the room revealed itself in the light. The room had changed from the last time they had been inside. A lot more wall decor on the walls. Odd trinkets that somehow looked right in place in their current arrangements. The door in the glass wall immediately attracted Ivy's attention, as it was the entrance to a place no one had seen. I will go inside there. You try to find if there is anything in here, Ivy said to Hermione and moved towards the door in the glass wall. She didn't have the key to this door, and the unlocking charm, Alohomora, didn't unlock the door. The only thing that remained was to break the door down. She knelt in front of the door and pointed her wand at the door, and took a deep breath. Diffindo, she spoke the incantation, and the lower half of the wooden door suddenly had a shallow cut on the init. Ivy frowned at the result of her magic. The severing charm, Diffindo, was a charm used to precisely and accurately cut something. Her mastery over the spell wasn't at the level where she could cut through the wood in one fell swoop. She shook her head and cast multiple severing charm to create cuts in the outline of a rectangle. Ugh, she silently cursed that the door didn't cut all the way through. Ivy made a decision and sat down on the floor. With both of her feet in front of her body, she kicked the carved outline. The next second, a rectangular chunk of wood broke with a woody snap. The sudden noise startled Hermione as she snapped her head towards Ivy and exclaimed, What are you doing? 
Why did you break the door? The door wasn't opening, so I kicked it down. Ivy got on all fours and carefully crawled inside. Are you mad? Screamed Hermione. West would know someone was here. No, he won't, came Ivy's voice from the other side of the door. A simple repairing charm and the door would be back to normal. No one will ever know that the door was broken. Oh, came out of Hermione, not knowing a retort to that. So, she continued to search in the office. Scene break. Quinn was fuming in rage as he watched Recon and saw Ivy Potter enter his workshop. He was so angry that his fists were shaking with anger as he moved towards his office. How dare they break into my office, thought Quinn as he stepped on the fifth floor. Every step of Quinn's feet left a patch of ice on the floor, which instantly evaporated into mist by the next second. The red hue on his nape had become deeper than ever before. And, his magic was now in control of his magic, accidental magic happening with his every step. Ivy Potter. Quinn growled in his mind. I helped her out not too long ago, and this is how she repays me? What gall. Quinn's mind wasn't even considering that he was the one to trap and blackmail her. The help he was talking about was to let her go with her owing a debt to him. The office door finally came into his views, and immediately Recon turned off, folded itself with snappy motions, and flew into Quinn's robes. Quinn cracked his neck for it to create popping noises. And, the second he was in touching distance of the door, the wood on the door parted from the middle, thin slivers of wood continuously moved to the side as the wooden door created a space for Quinn to step inside, showing Quinn's skill in transmutation. All noise disappeared for Quinn as he stepped inside the office through the opening in the door, and the first thing he saw was Hermione looking at the bookshelf behind his desk, reading a book. He saw her ears perk up from the noise of wood moving aside, but the second she saw Quinn step inside and her eyes widen in shock, darkness overtook her. Quinn, in the span of two to three seconds, had stunned Hermione Granger. He followed by putting her into a full body bind and conjured ropes to bind her body. The conjured ropes felt a tug as they moved with Quinn's wishes, and by using them, Hermione's unconscious body was lifted into the air and carelessly dumped into one of the client chairs. Quinn's expressionless, angry face turned towards the door in the glass wall which led to his workshop, and he clenched his fist tighter. Scene break. Ivy Potter looked at the dark room, illuminated by the light from her wand tip with wonder. There were a lot of fascinating things in here that she wasn't expecting. There were a lot of tables, cabinets, and cupboards along the walls. She could see various potion vials behind the glass of the cupboards, there were many potions, and she could see all the rainbow colors. As she moved around the room, she was tools hung on walls. She could see hammers, picks, measures, grip pliers, blades, tri-squares, gloves, goggles, scissors, snips, hand saws, and clamps. When she opened one of the shallow but wide drawers inside it were large sheets of different fabrics. Another similar drawer had distinct qualities and varieties of papers. She saw tons of different metals and woods in deep drawers. There were in the form of blocks, planks, strips, and even scraps. When she was walking around, she also found what looked like drafts for the notes that Quinn West had made last year, and surprisingly, there was another set for third-year subjects. Ivy decided to hurry and opened what looked like a file cabinet and saw a few manila folders. Each had a title on them. She lifted them each to read the titles. Project, Watch. Project, Vaults, Overview. Project, Fax. Project, Edison. Project, Engraver. Project, Icebox. Project, Noir. Project, Drone Vision. But Ivy couldn't even manage to open the manila folders as they were sealed, and they didn't unseal with the use of finite, so she had to put all of them back into the cabinet with frustration. It was at that point when she heard a thump and on the other side of the door. Hermione, did you find something? She said as she looked at more stuff, there is a lot of weird stuff in here. She froze when she heard the sound of a door opening with a creak. Ivy Potter turned on instinct, and the last thing Ivy saw before darkness took over her was the face of Quinn West staring at her from the door that she had previously broken. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, underscore L O T underscore dash A C underscore D underscore underscore. Pink, underscore U S underscore dash L underscore X U underscore I underscore. Red, W R A T H dash I R A. Yellow, underscore underscore E E underscore dash underscore underscore A underscore I T I underscore. Violet, underscore R I underscore E dash S underscore P E underscore B underscore underscore. Green, underscore N V underscore dash I underscore V I underscore I underscore. Orange, underscore L underscore T T underscore N underscore dash dash underscore U L underscore. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, owner of A dot I dot D, anger, rage, fury. Hermione Granger, infiltrator number one, covers the front office. Ivy Potter, infiltrator number two, covers the back workshop. Chapter 62, The One with Lambs and the Devil Ivy Potter groggily opened her eyes and saw herself staring at her lap because her neck wasn't supporting her head. She groaned and tried to lift her head, but maybe because she wasn't completely awake, she ended up throwing her head back and found herself staring straight up. The redhead squinted because of the bright light on the ceiling, and her dilated pupils couldn't let so much light into her eyes, causing her to squint so that her eyes could adjust themselves. Of course, the green-eyed girl wasn't thinking about any of this and just ended up groaning because of the bright light going into her eye. Her head swiveled to the side to remove her line of sight from the direct contact to the bright light, and when her eyes acclimated to the light, she saw her friend Hermione. 
Ivy's eyes opened wide when she saw Hermione's hands and torso tied to the chair she was sitting in with ropes. Hermione, she called out and tried to leave her chair to free her friend, but when her hands didn't move, she looked at her own body and saw ropes around her torso, forearms, and she could feel ropes binding her legs together. What in the bloody dash shock could be heard from her voice as she struggled against the ropes while simultaneously tried to wake up her friend? Hermione, wake up, Hermione. Her words seemed to work as the bushy-haired brunette groaned and moved her head, showing signs of regaining consciousness. Hermione went through the same routine as Ivy and panicked a little when she felt her body bound to the chair she was sitting on. She struggled against her bindings until she finally heard Ivy's voice. Hermione. When she looked to her right, she saw Ivy similarly bound her to a chair, just like her. Ivy, exclaimed Hermione, immediately feeling a little better to see her friend with her. What happened? How did this happen? I don't know, Ivy replied. She tried to think back to what happened before she was knocked out, and her eyes widened as she remembered. It was West Dash Dot. You two seem lively. That sentence cut Ivy off, and both girls stilled when they heard the words spoke in a grave tone. The girls finally looked to the front and saw the grand table in front of them. On the table, they saw two hands resting on it. When their eyes looked up, they saw that the rest of the person was hidden in the dark, and they could only make out the person's silhouette. You two are either really brave or extremely stupid to break into my office, said the person. The two girls immediately knew who the person was, and a moment later, it was confirmed as a light shone from the ceiling, illuminating the person sitting behind the table. Quinn West was staring at them with an apathetic look. If Ivy and Hermione weren't panicking, they would have noticed that the light in the room wasn't yellow but white, and it wasn't coming from a type of everlasting candles like it usually did in magical places. A light bulb in Hogwarts? That question would have been their first thought. But right now, all their attention was on Quinn West staring at them. It has been maybe five minutes since I stunned and bound both of you, started Quinn, placing a pocket watch on the table. It was a silver timepiece with Roman numerals written on black with blue for indicating time. The mechanism was exposed in the center. The hour, minute, and second hand were a similar blue, with the clock mechanism made of a golden material. I gave myself five minutes to calm down before I spoke to you too, he continued, but believe me when I say that those five minutes didn't help much. I am pretty much at the same level of anger I was before. Ivy and Hermione felt the ropes around them tighten a smidge. Both girls fidgeted in their seats. So, I will give you some free advice that will help you here, he leaned forward. Don't lie, don't bullshit, don't give me some lame excuses. I want to know why did you guys break into my office. After that, he went quiet and simply stared at them like he was waiting for an answer. Ivy and Hermione looked at each other and communicated with their eyes before they came to a decision which was to remain quiet. But the second they decided to remain silent, Quinn spoke up. Not saying isn't an option. You will be in deep trouble if you don't speak up, Quinn warned. Don't force my hand because it won't end well for both of you. Quinn reached into his robes and took out two wands, Ivy's and Hermione's wands. The reverse spell, Prior Incantato is a charm that forces the wand to create an echo of spells that were performed through it, he explained while he put the wands on the table, and they stood up straight, pointing towards the ceiling. I tried it out and found that both of you used Alohomora recently, which means you tried to open my office door, Quinn stared right into their eyes as he spoke. I have charmed my door against the unlocking charm, which means you most probably have the key, and only Filch has duplicate keys to all rooms. So I am confident to deduce that you girls stole the key from the caretaker. That is one strike against you guys. Stealing from the staff, he looked at them and scoffed. And, I thought you would learn your lesson. What would McGonagall think when I reveal these adventures to them? Ivy felt heat rush to her face because of the humiliation she was experiencing. Let's talk about Ms. Potter, Quinn continued. You used Defindo, the cutting spell for damaging my other door and then forced your way through. Quinn looked at the broken door to his left and spoke, by kicking the weakened wood. That, my pitiful intruders, is what you call the destruction of personal property. I crafted that door by myself, it is not the school's property, Quinn spoke with a leveled voice. The second strike. For the last strike, I am going to use the polyjuice incident, Ivy's and Hermione's eyes widened with those words. Ms. Granger was stuck in the hospital wing for weeks before the mishap passed, so we clearly established that she brewed the polyjuice potion. Madame Pomfrey would attest to that. The ingredients stolen from Professor Snape's storage were for multiple doses of the potion. Believe me, I checked, but you already know that, don't you? He scoffed once again. So, if I spin my story right and bring in Draco Malfoy, he will gladly tell that his two companions, Crab and Goyle, were acting very suspiciously that day. Quinn put his hand on his chest and talked, plus, my own account about catching Ivy Potter as Daphne Greengrass would be very damning. The professors would believe me because first, I am a model student. And second, I have the high ground here. I will bury you guys into the ground. He had one more card, and that was Prefect Percy Weasley meeting the two polyjuiced Gryffindor while they were disguised, but because he was busy blackmailing Ivy at that time, he wasn't sure if that event happened. Quinn tapped his table with his right hand index finger and asked, Now tell me why you are here, or else I would have you guys in deep trouble. Ivy gritted her teeth in humiliation, frustration, panic, and slight fear. She didn't want to say anything, but when she thought that Ron, Harry, and Hermione would get in trouble because of her, she spat out. I thought you opened the Chamber of Secrets, she sounded defeated. I thought you were the heir of Slytherin. 
The answer brought the anger in Quinn to a still. He, for a moment, didn't know what to think. Quinn had assumed that the two were here to get back at him for blackmailing Ivy. If he wasn't so angry, Quinn would have used legilimency on Hermione to dig out the information, but the red spot on his nape was so dark that Quinn wasn't thinking straight out of rage. But, the bewildered feeling didn't last long before anger returned, and he pounded on the table. Why in the shitty world would you think that? He yelled at the two girls, who recoiled because of the loud shout. Ivy, who didn't like the shouting, snapped back with her reasoning. You are famous for staying out after curfew. And no prefect, teacher, ghost, or even portraits have seen you outside after the curfew. Despite that, everyone knows you roam outside, she explained. So, I thought you were looking for the Chamber of Secrets last year and found it. And, this year, you released it upon the school. Oh, come on. Quinn rolled his eyes. So, now anyone who breaks curfew is the heir of Slytherin. I thought you were, I don't know, what is the word, smart. What kind of idiotic reasoning is that? The redhead glared at her capturer and bit back, then what about our conversation when I was polyjuiced into Daphne? Everything from your first words to me there was a test to see if I was the real deal or not. How did you even assume that I wasn't the real one? I thought that heir of Slytherin could recognize Slytherin students. Quinn made a face that could only be described as I am looking at stupid. I taught Daphne and Tracy for a week, plus I have known them since last year and as I told you, my memory is excellent. I knew you weren't Daphne because even though you looked like her, spoke like her, and even your expression was on point, you didn't walk like Daphne, you didn't have the feel of Daphne Greengrass. She has a really refined way of holding herself, and the moment I saw you, I was sure that you weren't the real deal. Even though Quinn was angry, it was righteous anger, so he was able to lie right through his teeth and speak the bullshit about posture and gait, which, even though true, Quinn didn't notice at first glance. Ivy, on the other hand, was feeling angry at being captured. Plus, she just heard Quinn imply she wasn't as refined as Daphne Greengrass. Then what about your expression during the time when Mrs. Norris got petrified? You looked relieved, and I saw it clearly, so don't deny it. Quinn was taken aback at that. He didn't think that someone was paying attention to him when there were more shocking things to see like, words written in blood on the wall and a possibly dead cat. I thought the bloody cat was dead and was relieved that it wasn't a student. Quinn fought back with his reasoning. Come on. He looked at Hermione and asked, don't tell me she convinced you with this kind of clearly idiotic reasoning. I expected better from you, Ms. Granger. Ivy felt more pissed from that and yelled, oh yeah, then what about the ring that you are wearing? What is the deal with that? It is clearly some kind of artifact. It is abnormally eye-catching for a normal ring. I am sure that it controls the Slytherin's monster. Quinn laughed a laugh full of mocking, oh my god, you are clearly dumber than your brother. I can't believe I made a mistake judging a person. Hermione, who was on the side, wasn't sure how to feel. She sat in a chair, bound by ropes, as she looked back and forth between her best friend and her captor. Those two were exchanging words with each other, as she didn't exist at all. Don't get her wrong, she didn't want Quinn West to yell and mock her, but being completely ignored when she sat just an eye glance away was a little bit hurtful. As she looked at the two yelling at each other, and even though their conversation was mainly Quinn shut down Ivy's accusations, Hermione thought they would get along in another setting. Quinn stopped laughing mockingly at Ivy as he raised his left hand with the gold ring on his middle finger and pointed at it with his other hand, this ring you so stupidly think is a monster controlling artifact isn't actually a ring at all. Ivy and Hermione frowned at those words. Look carefully, as Quinn said that the ring disappeared from his finger. Now, both of you, look at your left hands. The two girls looked at their hands, and two pairs of eyes widened as they saw identical gold rings on their middle fingers. The ring was an illusion made from illusion magic that I have been keeping up the entire year, Quinn explained. And the reason it is so eye-catching is that I made it so it would catch eyes. A slash N, 1. He rubbed his temple as he continued, it is a way for me to practice magic. If the ring was eye-catching and noticeable, then more people would stare at it, and that would increase the difficulty as the eyes stay at the illusion longer and increase the probability of someone figuring out the illusion. Ivy opened her mouth a couple of times, but she couldn't think of anything to say. Plus, when she looked at her finger, she didn't know what to say. She could clearly see the ring, but there was no feeling of metal against her skin. This clearly was the sign that the gold ring was an illusion. Quinn was now feeling too tired to be feeling angry. He was exhausted from all the yelling and feeling furious. Ugh, this a stool, why couldn't it be a chair with a back to it? Quinn sighed as a faint blue color graced his nape. He looked at the two bound girls and thought what to do with them when an intensely deep shade of yellow. Quinn suddenly took a deep breath before his eyes become laser focused. I will confirm this from my side, Quinn spoke. I am not the heir of Slytherin, and I didn't open the Chamber of Secrets. I have no relation to the incidents happening. Plus, if I was the heir of Slytherin, he smirked and slackly pointed at the two girls. You two would be dead by now. Ivy and Hermione felt a chill go down their spines as they thought about the scenario. Quinn had stunned them without breaking a sweat, and if he was the heir of Slytherin, they might not have woken up. If we don't return, you would be in big trouble, Ivy tried to bluff in case Quinn tried something. I have told Harry and Ron that we would be coming here, and if we don't return, they would know where to find us. The bluff didn't even stand up for a single second. No, they don't. Given Harry Potter's and Ronald Weasley's personalities, they would have been jumped me by now. Ivy's lips twitched at the swift reply. 
I will tell you the thoughts which are in my head right now. Right now, nothing will give me more satisfaction to throw you guys to the wolves and see them chew you out. Believe me, it will make me very, very happy, red flashed momentarily before the yellow came back. But, that won't do me any good in the long term, and I really like the long term game. So, I going to do you both a favor. He interlocked his fingers and spoke to Ivy, Ms. Potter, I will offer the same deal as before. I am willing to forget this slight behavior action of yours if you owe me big time. He glanced at Hermione and added, the same goes for you, Ms. Granger. He turned back to Ivy and continued, before this, I wasn't going to make you do anything uncomfortable when I cash in what you owe me, but this time, Ivy felt suddenly felt nervous at Quinn's words. With what you just did, be ready for being forced into some really uncomfortable situations in the future because I will not hold back. And, don't even think about getting out of this anytime soon because you messed up big time. Quinn looked at the two and spoke. So, what is your decision? Just know that if you accept now and refuse responsibility later, I would make your lives miserable. He paused for effect before speaking. And, I assure you, you will regret every moment, so think carefully. You can accept my proposition and get a chance to escape the consequences of your actions, or you can go down now as I involve the professors and really stack the cards against you. And even if somehow you got away with a slap on your wrist, I will start a campaign to ruin your reputation among the students. When Quinn was done speaking, he raised the fake wand for the first time since entering the office and waved it so that the two chairs of his captives were close to each other. Quinn was allowing them to have a private conversation by whispering to each other. But he did sneakily send a probe into Hermione's unprotected mind to monitor her thoughts. The thoughts and emotions were pretty standard ones like fear, nervousness, unwillingness, and some hopelessness. But added to that was the quick-thinking nature of Hermione Granger. She was thinking about the pro and cons of the situation, and Quinn was happy to see that she considered taking the deal would be better than to let it go to the professors. After a minute of muffled conversation, Ivy spoke up with unwillingness apparent in his voice. We accept, the answer was brief as she didn't want to speak anything else to Quinn. Quinn nodded and pointed his wand at the broken workshop door. Are you sure? Because the second I repair the door, the deal would be set in stone. The second I release the spell, you both would be under my debt. I will not listen to words like we changed our minds, and if I did hear those words, then the response would be welcome to hell, and I hope you hate your stay. Hermione nodded with a defeated sigh, yes, we agree. Good, said Quinn as he waved his wand and spoke the incantation. The broken part of the door floated back to the main body, and all three people saw the door repair itself back to its form before it was brutally smashed. The deal is set, smiled Quinn, feeling good about increasing his influence upon the brains of the Golden Squad. Hermione and Ivy looked down at their bodies and watched the ropes loosen before vanishing into the nothingness. You guys are free to go, and please take your wands, said Quinn, once again feeling some mental exhaustion, plus his throat was a little sore. Ivy carefully extended her hand and took hold of hers and Hermione's wand before handing her friend her wand. The two girls looked up before they stood up, ready to leave. As Ivy turned around, she had a random thought and recalled Quinn's words the first time she had come here. Information is always available at the right price. She didn't know what possessed, but she turned back and bluntly asked. What can you tell me about the Slytherin's monster and Chamber of Secrets? Hermione was about to say something, but Ivy clasped her hand to stop her from talking. Quinn made a face and said, didn't we just go through this whole farce? I am not the heir of Slide Dash. Ivy cut him by asking, I am asking for information about it. She took a breath before saying, I am employing your services. I am willing to pay. Quinn would be lying if he said that this didn't surprise him. He wasn't expecting this question from Ivy at this moment, and he let it show on his face. If Ivy wasn't completely serious, she would have felt the triumph of surprising Quinn, but right now, she wanted an answer. A vein violet flashed, and Quinn decided to go for it, showing that he indeed knew everything. He stared at the redhead girl before saying, give me a minute. He stood up, entered his workshop, and returned with a sheet of paper in his hand. He put the sheet of paper upside down on his office table and gestured them to sit. When the girls sat down, Quinn spoke up, the price for this information is simple. I want you to get me the Marauder's map. Ivy's eyes widened when she heard the word Marauder came out of Quinn's mouth. Quinn caught the look of recognition in Ivy's expression, you know about them, they are related to you? Yes, Ivy nodded. But, I have no idea what is the Marauder's map. It didn't surprise Quinn that she didn't know about it. The original map was confiscated from the creators years ago. It wasn't exaggerating to say they thought it didn't survive. A slash N, too. You will find it with the Weasley twins, informed Quinn. Get it to me before the end of this year. Do you agree? Ivy thought about it before agreeing. I will get it for you. Good, Quinn smiled. Remember, it is the Marauder's map. He opened a drawer in his table and took out a parchment roll, a pot of ink, and a quill. Copy the content in your handwriting. You aren't to tell anyone that you got the information from me, said Quinn. He didn't want any physical connecting it to him. I have written the sources of everything I am giving you. You can find everything in the Hogwarts library. So, nothing comes back to me. Ivy nodded before hurriedly flipping the paper and reading the contents with Hermione. The girls were shocked to see the answer. Basilisk. Aha, uh -huh, spoke Quinn, Salazar Slytherin was a parcel tongue, so I made an assumption that it would be a serpentine creature. Did a little digging, and the Basilisk was sitting right there. 
Plus, all the roosters are dead. Hermione frowned and read the contents, Basilisk has a murderous stare, and all who are fixed with the beam of its eye shall suffer instant death. The students who were targeted aren't dead. None of them saw the basilisk's eyes directly, explained Quinn, Mrs. Norris, the cat, had a puddle of water near where we found it. Colin Creevy saw it through the viewfinder of his camera. Justin Finchfletchley saw it through nearly headless Nick's ghost body, and the ghost can't die because he is already dead. And, finally, Susanna Hesleton, the latest victim, saw it in the bathroom mirror. So, even though they didn't die, everyone still got petrified, Quinn ominously smiled, so, when you go out, remember to look around the bends through mirrors because petrification is much better than death. Ivy and Hermione felt cold go down their bodies at the words and that scary smile. As Ivy started to write everything down, Hermione asked, what about the Chamber of Secrets? Quinn glanced at her and said, you would have to ask Moaning Myrtle about it. Just ask how she died and lead from there. Quinn had actually talked to the dead girl, so the information really came from her, and it covered him from all bases. After the girls were done with copying the contents, they stood up and proceeding to leave. No goodbyes or even looks were exchanged. The two parties weren't on friendly terms after what happened in the room. When the two girls walked to the door, Quinn waved his finger and made some slight changes. The Gryffindor girls closed the door behind them, and when Ivy looked back at the door, she saw a plaque with the 773H written on it. Ivy frowned as the plaque wasn't there when they entered. Hermione, was this here before? Hermione turned her attention from the paper, thinking that she needed to conjure some mirrors to look around the corners. She looked at the plaque, and it immediately understood the wording. Read it backward and upside down, said Hermione. Ivy tilted her head and thought about the wording backward and upside down. Hell, she spoke. It was just like their experience just now. It was hell for them, and they only escaped from it by making a deal with the devil. Inside the office, Quinn smiled as if he could see through the door and stare at the two lambs, who just lost their souls to the devil. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, S-L-O-T-H dash A-C-E-D-I-A. Pink, underscore U S underscore dash L underscore X U underscore I underscore. Red, W R A T H dash I R A. Yellow, underscore underscore E E underscore dash underscore underscore A underscore I T I underscore. Violet, P R I D E dash S U P E R B I A. Green, underscore N V underscore dash I underscore V I underscore I underscore. Orange, underscore L underscore T T underscore N underscore dash dash underscore U L underscore. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, Devil in the Office. Ivy Potter, Lamb Number One, has guts to do business after all that. Hermione Granger, Lamb Number Two, sidelined during the whole ordeal. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. A slash N1, it goes two ways. It attracted the attention of many people, and then it attracted the reader's attention, if you get what I mean. Asterisk. A slash N2. So my reasoning behind downplaying marauders is because first, it was something they called themselves in school. I mean, who carries their school group name to their adulthood? Second, one marauder betrayed them by defecting to the other side, and led to the death of one members, James, parents to die protecting the Potter twins. Plus, it is said that Sirius was always welcome to the Potter house, which meant he was also close to the Potter parents. That is the parental figure of at least two members, dead. So, I don't think they would like to call themselves marauders in their adulthood because it would bring bad memories. At least, that is my reasoning. Tell me what do you guys think? Chapter 63, Into the Chamber of Secrets Quinn stayed in his office for a while after Hermione and Ivy left his office. Thinking about what had happened in the last few minutes. At first, Quinn was dead set on getting them into trouble. The only motive in his mind was to catch them, force them to reveal what they were doing, and then throw them to the professors. He was ready to throw his family's weight around if Dumbledore tried to pull some favoritism bullshit. But, as he talked to them and Ivy Potter told him she suspected him of being the heir of Slytherin, it stunned Quinn, shocked at the idiocy, and while it didn't extinguish his anger, it did lower it to a level where he didn't want them to get into trouble. So, he decided to suck Ivy Potter and Hermione Granger into the quagmire of debt. He gave them an option, to do whatever the hell he wanted from them, with no questions asked. It was always good to have favors saved in the bank for later use. But, the thing that happened next was the most surprising. Ivy Potter asked him for information, it dazed him for a moment. Typically, he wouldn't have given that type of information, but something in him wanted to impress, so he dished out the information. Now that he sat, Ivy Potter's actions impressed. She was resourceful and quick to act, and if forced to admit, quite daring. The last thing at the door was just theatrics to solidify an impression, and a way of warning them not to try something that they would regret. His payment for the information was to get the Marauder's map. He could have gotten the map by himself, but he felt it would be less work for him if he outsourced the acquisition of the map to someone familiar with the current owners. As for what he wanted from the map? He just wanted to check something out, and then the map would be returned back. His recon was better than the Marauder's map. He had no desire to possess the Marauder's map. All right, let's leave, muttered Quinn, stood up, and after giving the office one last look, Quinn exited the office, looking in behind him, resetting the sensory ward on the door. Quinn had a free hour, so he decided to walk to the kitchen and grab something to eat. He was hungry after all the shouting he did. 
Quinn walked down the grand staircase and was on a moving staircase climbing down. As he was halfway through the staircase, he saw a fifth-year Slytherin student also coming up the stairs from the ground floor. Terence Higgins, identified Quinn as he looked at the older student. It made him wonder what Terence Higgins was doing here, but he had just crossed the entrance to the grand staircase, so Quinn assumed the Slytherin was going there. Ravenclaw and Slytherin met eyes while they were on their respective staircase. Quinn saw an apathetic look from the Slytherin, and Terence saw the same expression from the Ravenclaw. The two climbed up slash down their sets of stairs without a single word to each other. The two did glance at each other from the corner of their eyes. Quinn paused his steps, and he didn't know why but Terence Higgins attracted his attention. He turned back to look at the Slytherin student and saw that Terence was also staring back at him. The two stared at each other, none of the two blinked or removing their eyes from each other and maintained firm eye contact. Terence Higgins seemed satisfied with the stare down, turned back, and walked away from Quinn. Quinn's eyes lingered on the Slytherin for a moment longer before he similarly turned away and walked away. Terence Higgins, thought Quinn. He seemed interesting. Scene break. After having a hearty meal, Quinn neared the Ravenclaw common room. His belly was full and happy, and with a soft smile on his face, he reached near the common room and caught the sight of a prefect standing near the corridor which led to the entrance. Quinn wasn't going to greet the prefect and just walk into the common room, but the prefect called out to him. West, the prefect called, there is an emergency curfew until further notice. Professor Flitwick said that no one is to remain outside. Quinn's legs stopped and turned towards the prefect. Oh, why is that? The Slytherin's monster struck again, he explained. They found Hermione Granger petrified near the library, and Ivy Potter is missing. She leaned in and whispered, the heir of Slytherin left another message, right underneath the first one. There was a pause before she spoke the message, her skeleton will lie in the chamber forever. The gears in Quinn's mind moved at a rapid speed as he connected the dots. They must have gone to the library to verify the information. Quinn had given references, so it wasn't a wild assumption. And the heir of Slytherin attacked. Quinn looked at the prefect and nodded, thanks for the hard work. I will go to the common room right away. The prefect nodded, and Quinn left, but the moment the prefect turned her back, Quinn disappeared out of sight. Quinn, who made himself invisible and silenced his footsteps, looked at the prefect and cast magic. The Ravenclaw prefect was on the guard slash guide duty saw a rubber ball bounce in front of her, and it bounced away to a bend. She furrowed her brows and walked to the bend in the corridor, but when she looked, the ball wasn't anywhere to be seen. She felt something, causing her to turn back. The result was the same, and there was nothing to be seen. And for Quinn? He was already far away from the prefect and was walking towards Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. The magic he used on the prefect was illusion magic. The rubber ball was an auditory and visual illusion to draw the prefect away from the direction he was going. And the slight presence near her back was just a tactile sensation of wind brushing against to make her look towards the common room so she wouldn't notice the invisible Quinn as he was slightly noticeable while walking. Scene break. Moaning Myrtle's bathroom was a second floor girl's lavatory. It was situated right above the Great Hall. Myrtle Warren's death had caused the restroom to be placed out of order, not functioning as a typical restroom since the tragedy. When Quinn entered the lavatory, still invisible and the sound of his clothes and shoes silenced, his eyes shined when he saw the vast hole in one stall. He is already in, thought Quinn. By he Quinn meant Harry Potter as he was sure that Voldemort would know more about the chamber and would close the tunnel down. The invisible boy wasted no time and jumped right into the pipe tunnel. It was like rushing down an endless, slimy, dark slide. He could see more pipes branching off in all directions, but none as broad as his, which twisted and turned, sloping steeply downward, and knew that he was falling deeper below the school than even the dungeons. Quinn held himself back from screaming out of part excitement and part fear at the sheer length of the slide ride. The second Quinn exited the tunnel, he came across a nervously fidgeting Ron Weasley in his spot. The redhead Weasley was repeatedly glancing at the path going inside. Seeing that, Quinn frowned and immediately sent a mental probe into Ron's mind and found why he was standing here. The gist of the situation from Ron's mind was that they found the information on Hermione just like the cannon. Harry, just like the cannon, figured out the location, and he did it in almost instantly. This Harry Potter is smarter, Quinn remarked in his mind. But, the part different from cannon was that Harry and Ron came down here alone, without Lockhart or any professor at all. He might be smarter, but coming here alone was dumb. Quinn didn't even think that he, too, had come here alone with no assistance. Harry had told Ron to wait here and if he didn't return in an hour, go and call someone. Ron had tried to refuse and accompany him, but Harry had convinced his best mate to stay here. Quinn moved along, leaving behind Ron Weasley, who didn't know that someone had passed by without him knowing. After walking on the path, Quinn reached a bend, and when he turned on it, he saw a solid wall with a circular hole in it. All right, this is it, thought Quinn and just stood there. He stood near the circular hole and tried to listen to any noise coming from inside. Quinn had no intention to go inside till he got some confirmation that it was safe to go inside. Harry Potter might have survived the Basilisk without any counter to the Basilisk's death gaze, but Quinn West wasn't taking any chances. After a while and a few rumbles and tremors, Quinn finally heard a yell. No. Quinn heard from who he thought was Riddle screaming. Leave the bird? Leave the bird? The boy is behind you? You can still smell him? Kill him. 
All right, that is the cue, Quinn whispered as he just heard Riddle scream at the Basilisk to find Harry by smell, which meant that the Basilisk was blind. Good riddance to the death glare. Walking inside, Quinn saw towering stone pillars entwined with more carved serpents rose to support a ceiling lost in darkness, casting long, black shadows through the odd, greenish gloom that filled the place. After crossing the hallway slowly, taking his time, not hurrying at all, cruising along the path as he heard more shouts and some phoenix singing, he finally saw the giant face statue, the mouth open. He would have spent time just watching the face statue, but his eyes were stuck on the enormous green-scaled body of the basilisk. As Quinn walked closer, he saw Harry Potter half-sitting, supporting his body with the stone wall behind. But, Harry Potter was unconscious. Fox the phoenix cried some tears on Harry Potter's wounds. You're dead, Harry Potter, said Riddle's specter. Dead. Even Dumbledore's bird knows it. Do you see what he's doing, Potter? He's crying. He ignored the specter for a second and paid attention to Harry Potter. He could see the pained expression on Harry's face ease, but the boy who lived was still unconscious. Fox stopped crying, and then there was a bright flash of fire, and the majestic turkey bird turned into ash. Burning day, exclaimed Quinn. From the ashes, a baby phoenix poked its head out. The newly born bird, who was really ugly, and looked like a decrepit-looking, half-plucked turkey, glared at the specter of Tom Riddle with its young eyes. Burning day was the name of the day in which a phoenix burst into flame and was reborn from the ashes. What a sucky timing, Quinn shook his head. This event was different from the canon, as Fox Burning Day was much before the current day. I am impressed that you managed to kill the Basilisk with the help of the dumb bird. I wasn't expecting to lose the Basilisk today, Riddle's specter smirked and chuckled as he looked at the unconscious body of Harry Potter. But, it doesn't matter. In a few minutes, I will return to this world of the living. It is a pity that even with the Phoenix's tears, you won't be able to leave here alive. He turned to look at the face statue of Salazar Slytherin. I will make my ancestor proud and return the name of Slytherin back to its intended glory and it will start with the sacrifice of the boy who lived and his sister. My future self somehow died by his hand, and today I will take revenge. The specter looked back to the body of Harry Potter, intending to finish the boy, but his brows furrowed when he saw a stone dome over the place where the diminutive phoenix sat. It is really a pity, Specter Tom heard a voice from his back. He turned back to see a boy standing as he looked down at his host and the petrified body of Ivy Potter. You came really close to coming back to life, you know, really close. Specter Tom Riddle clutched Harry Potter's wand in his hand, the wand which was the sister to his own you. He peered at the boy. You are Quinn West. He knew about the boy, the so-called smartest of his age, and the owner of the weird consultation of his in Hogwarts. Quinn looked down at the host of Tom Riddle's diary Horcrux. Terence Higgins, Quinn spoke. So, I found Tom Riddle possessing you interesting and not the guy itself. I didn't see that coming. Quinn looked at the specter that was a soul split molded into Horcrux. Specter Riddle saw Quinn raise his hand towards him, and the next second he found the wand flying from his hand into the air before it paused for a second in the air and rushed into Quinn's hand. Wandless magic, Specter Riddle exclaimed at the magic. Yup, Quinn smiled as he fiddled with the wand. I am pretty good at it. Why am I being modest? You are going to be dead shortly. I am really good at it. Me, dead, Specter Riddle laughed, but his eyes were eyeing Quinn critically. The boy had come out of nowhere and had just taken the wand from him. Of course, he replied as he moved towards the basilisk head while putting gloves on his hands. A horcrux doesn't mean immortality, you know. Specter Riddle's eyes sharply narrowed as he growled, how did you know? Quinn smirked as he put his hand on one of the basilisk fangs and pulled it out in one fell swoop. You have been here for the entire year, Quinn said as he appraised the venomous fang. So, you must have heard about my consultation service. I am an information dealer, so of course, I know what is happening in my territory. Scepter Riddle started to feel nervous as he saw the boy move towards his diary slash container with the fang in his hand. What are you doing? Scepter Tom yelled and followed after Quinn, answer me. Do you know that basilisk venom can destroy horcruxes? It is quite ironic, you know, Basilisk and Horcruxes were Herpo the Fowl's creations. He stood on top of the diary Horcrux and grinned towards the Horcrux projection, he created magic that wouldn't allow him to die, but at the same time, he created something that could destroy said magic. The projection glared at Quinn, and immediately Quinn felt a mental attack hit against his shields. Red, violet, and green hues switched on Quinn's nape before settling on the green. He pursed his lips before smiling, it won't work, that mental attack. I have shields powerful enough to deflect the attack. But, I have to say, you are better than me at legilimency. I can't induce mental pain with mental attacks yet. I haven't reached that far yet. Specter Riddle didn't speak and shot out a scarlet jet of magic towards Quinn, but it met an invisible shield before it could reach Quinn. It is useless, Quinn's soft voice reached the Specter. You aren't my match without a wand, and even if you had a wand, I still would have crushed you. A farewell smile graced Quinn's lips as he spoke, so, Tom Riddle, or as you like to be called, Lord Voldemort, it is a farewell. Goodbye. All the while, Spectre Riddle kept shooting low-level spells at Quinn, but Quinn's shield defended against them without taking a major load. Quinn seized the Basilisk Fang and plunged it straight into the heart of the book. There was a long, dreadful, piercing scream. Ink spurted out of the diary in torrents, streaming over Quinn's gloved hands, flooding the floor. 
Riddle was writhing and twisting, screaming, and flailing, and then the specter was gone. Silence except for the steady drip of ink still oozing from the diary. The basilisk venom had burned a sizzling hole right through it. Then came a faint moan from the end of the chamber. Quinn looked up to see Terence Higgins stirring up and immediately sent a stunning charm towards the waking up Slytherin, knocking him out. Quinn didn't want anyone else to see him here. I have to move quickly, murmured Quinn and hurried towards the basilisk and took out six vials from his robes, and with a twitch of magic, the vials expanded into their original size. The original vials had quite a large volume. One by one, the beaker vials were placed below the fangs. Quinn focused his magic on the muscle that released the venom from the secondary venom ducts in the fangs and exerted a lot of magic to milk out the basilisk venom. He completely filled the six big beaker vials with venom, and Quinn was sure that there still was a lot of basilisk venom in the venom sack. Hot damn, Quinn expressed his admiration. Basilisk body sure is magic resistance. Even the inside is quite tough. He had forced a lot of magic on the muscles that pushed the venom out of the fangs. After retrieving the lids for the special beakers, Quinn transmuted the caps on the beaker vials to create six closed cylinders. His eyes flashed with delight as he saw the six full vials, yellow briefly flashing on his nape. This is more than enough, nodded Quinn. He currently had no plans for the venom other than to use it to destroy the horcruxes. Even one of these vials was way too much for destroying all the remaining horcruxes. Quinn stared at the basilisk smelly mouth. A yellow flashed on his nape, and he broke a dozen fangs from the basilisk, eyeing the fangs with a captivated look. The fangs were wrapped into thick bundles of cloth and then pocketed into Quinn's robes. Looking around, Quinn took in the scene and smiled. Not bad for a day's work. Not bad at all. His eyes saw the petrified Ivy Potter and muttered, You better come back to normal. I want that payment paid to me this year. Quinn turned invisible and walked away from the ordeal without looking back, not forgetting to vanish the stone dome from over the ugly baby bird. If he wasn't in stealth mode, Quinn would have hummed a song in joy. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, S L O T H dash A C E D I A. Pink, underscore U S underscore dash L U X U R I A. Red, W R A T H dash I R A. Yellow, G R E E D dash underscore underscore A underscore I T I underscore. Violet, P R I D E dash S U P E R B I A. Green, underscore N V underscore dash I underscore V I underscore I A. Orange, underscore L underscore T T underscore N underscore dash dash G U L A. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, Basie Lisks, gone? Horcrux, gone? Venom, have it all. Spectre Riddle, Horcrux, oh, he dead. So dead. Harry Potter, Basie Lisk Slayer, props to the dude. Fox, Phoenix, going from big beautiful turkey to baby ugly turkey. Ivy Potter, petrified, even when turned to stone, her creditor wants the payment, pitiful. Terence Higgins, Slytherin, random dude victim to Lucius Malfoy's decision. Chapter 64, Descent into Madness The day after Quinn went into the Chamber of Secret and killed the first Tom Riddle slash Voldemort's Horcrux, Quinn was sitting in his office, cleaning his tools and other things in his office. Diary Horcrux of the 16-year-old Tom Riddle was destroyed when Quinn stabbed it with basilisk venom while making small talk with the soul split tied into the Horcrux. From that entire ordeal, Quinn took his payment for doing the job. The fee was in the form of liters of basilisk venom and a dozen fangs from the basilisk. Last night, he also made sure that the four students it out of the Chamber of Secrets by checking their location status on recon. And as he expected, three out of the four people were in the hospital wing. The three being petrified Ivy Potter, Basilisk bit Harry Potter, and Horcrux possessed Terence Higgs. Ronald Weasley, who was untouched from the Chamber of Secrets, was back in the Gryffindor dorm, sleeping at night in his own dorm bed. Quinn, who was the invisible participant, was able to enter and exit the Chamber of Secrets without being detected, reaped some benefits and slew a part of the Dark Lord Voldemort. There was nothing in the entire ordeal that was detrimental to Quinn. The owner of the A.I.D consultation service sat in his workshop, doing spring cleaning of his various tools and utensils in the workshop. It was a good day, followed by a fruitful day. As Quinn worked away in silence, there was a knock on his door, followed by the door chime ringing with the door opening. Quinn set down equipment in his hand on the table and walked to the office to meet the client. Waiting for him in the office was Gilderoy Lockhart, Hogwitz current defense against dark arts professor. Ah, good afternoon, professor. Quinn greeted as he sat behind the table and gestured Lockhart to take a seat. How may I help you, Professor? To Quinn, Lockhart was a cash cow he had milked throughout the year, and if that cash cow walked to his doorstep, he won't reject it and welcome it in pleasantly because of its services. Plus, Lockhart had signed an all-year pass to the restricted section of the library, so Lockhart, who Quinn previously considered as an annoying bug, was now his golden egg-laying goose. Quinn, just the student I was hoping to see, said Lockhart, his every motion brimming with theatrics. He sat down and put on that blinding, million-watt smile. I have a matter of utmost importance to discuss with you. Of course, Professor, do tell, smiled Quinn, being polite to the man who had bought him close to his goal of filling a tub with sickles. The man had single-handedly given Quinn the asset, which allowed Quinn to complete 90% of his aim. According to his estimates, he would reach the target by the end of the school year. Quinn, I want to talk to you about the fan club, said Lockhart, opening the conversation. 
Professor, I am sure that you would be able to gain more by talking to the managers of your club, Quinn put on an apologetic smile. I am not involved in the daily activities of the fan club. I am not talking about the club, Lockhart shook his head and explained. I am talking about the merchandise sold in the club. Quinn's eyes sparkled as he clapped his hands in excitement. Professor, do you have a new product idea? Quinn took out a sheet of paper and uncapped his pen, ready to take notes. Do tell. He wasn't going to let this opportunity pass by. Yes, I am talking about the products you sell. But I am not here to tell you about a new product. Quinn's shoulders slumped as he capped his pen and put it down on the table. His initial excitement, deflating in an instant. So, what is it do you want to talk about, Professor? Lockhart cleared his throat and spoke. Those merchandises that you have been selling through the club are all based on me. Lockhart puffed his chest and bragged. Order of Merlin, third class, honorary member of the Dark Force Defense League, and five-time winner of which weekly's Most Charming Smile Award. So, it is normal that you should divide the profits with me. Lockhart's voice was filled with confidence. He spoke like the thing he was saying was obvious. How about we spit up the profits 90 to 10? Of course, 90 to me and 10 to you. Lockhart looked down on Quinn as he spoke, your products only sold because of my reputation. Without me, no one would buy things from a child. Lockhart looked at Quinn as an easy-to-push-around child who would buckle under his words. Quinn tilted his head in confusion, putting on an expression of confusion. All the previous politeness from him draining from his face and eyes. What are you talking about, Professor? Quinn opened a drawer on his table and took out a sheet of parchment. This is not what we discussed. Quinn slid the parchment towards Lockhart so that he could read it. This document clearly states that you relinquish all earnings of my sales. The profits from anything I sell will go to me and not to you. Lockhart's eyes popped when he saw the signature on the page while Quinn talked. T this, stuttered Lockhart as he looked up from the document. I have no recollection of this. I don't remember signing this. I don't know what to say, Professor, said Quinn, putting on an oblivious expression. You were the one to sign it, it is your sign. You can even have it checked for magic forgery. With this document, you have no right to ask me for even a single canute of what I made from selling the products even though they are based on you. Quinn intertwined his fingers and finished, sorry, professor, but I can't help you in this matter. You are already signed over the rights to me. It stunned Lockhart into silence, which was a lot to say because the man rarely stopped talking. He just kept staring at the document in front of him. Does anyone else know about this? Asked Lockhart, staring at the document. And, do you have a copy of this? I want one so that I have a copy. This is a private venture, professor. I, alone, handle the production and supply of the merchandise, Quinn took the document which Lockhart placed on the table and said, this is the original, I will make a permanent copy and bring it out to you just in a minute, Lockhart's eyes shined as he immediately took out his wand and pointed it at Quinn, then it is settled, I will do you a favor and erase the memory of this document from your mind, and then you will give me the money you made from the sales, previously, I was going to give you a 10% share, but now, I am going to cut that in half, and you will only get 5%, Lockhart loudly laughed as he watched Quinn, you might not know this, but the memory charm is my premier skill. It is my bread and butter as to speak. I built myself on this charm, so don't worry about accidents because I am really good at it. The memory charm, Obliviate, also known as the forgetfulness charm, was a charm used to erase specific memories from an individual's mind. I focused my considerable talents solely on the memory charm until I perfected it, making it the only spell I can perform without fail, Lockhart eyed Quinn with delight in his eyes. In my pursuit of fame and glory, I utilized the charm extensively on people who performed heroic feats after interviewing them on every detail of their works, so they would not go babbling while I take their credits in the form of my books. He smiled appreciatively at Quinn and spoke, I am planning to leave Hogwarts tomorrow. This school has dangers lurking in every corner. The monster of Slytherin is still on the loose, and it struck again yesterday. I have to leave this place before it gets to me. No one had told Lockhart that the monster of Slytherin was already taken care of, and the school was safe from further petrification. The fraud author still believed that the horror was still roaming in the castle. The money I get from you will be more than enough for another expedition to a foreign land to interview another fellow and do research on my EXT book. He pointed his wand at Quinn, ready to cast the charm, and grinned. Maybe I will thank you in my next books for your help. Not that you will remember it. Quinn stood in his place looking at Lockhart with an expression that showed no fear, horror, or any negative emotion and conversely portrayed boredom. His face screamed, why did I expect anything else through the expression? He glanced at Lockhart's wand, and the next moment Lockhart's hand was forced open as the wand shot out his hand into Quinn's grasp. And here I thought you escaped your original fate yesterday, a sigh escaped Quinn. He looked up at the shocked fraud in front of him and spoke. That is the problems with villains. They spend too much time explaining their plans. You should have straight out erased my memories without the monologue. Not that it would have worked. An alternating yellow and red flashed on Quinn's nape as he used magic, and Lockhart's knees buckled. The blonde pompous fraud fell onto the chair that Quinn expertly positioned just underneath him. Lockhart looked down at his hands and watched as ropes slithered around his hands, legs, and torso. I accept I didn't use honorable means to get you to sign the document, said Quinn as he walked towards Lockhart. But neither did you. All your works are based on lies and deceit. 
So, in this case, I like to think of myself as a thief stealing from a thief. Plus, it is not my fault that people believe in the silly books that you wrote. Putting his hands on Lockhart's shoulder, Quinn leaned in and whispered, the attempt to erase my memories was a mistake because it got me furious. But the bigger mistake was to try and take my money from me. My family is exceedingly rich, richest in magical Britain. I don't need to care about money as I can use all I want, and I would have more if I ask for it. I don't need to work a single day in my life, and I won't ever run out of riches. He chuckled before continuing. But, there is something special about the money I earned myself. This money results from my hard work and cunning to hoodwink you and then draft interesting things products that the students would buy. Lockhart winced when he felt Quinn's grip tighten on his shoulders. You, trying to get your hands on that money, is unacceptable to me. It isn't something I can forgive even though you were a sizable reason that I was able to earn a lot of it. Lockhart heard a throaty chuckle in his ear as Quinn spoke. So, a punishment is in order. Quinn removed his hand from Lockhart's shoulder and stood up straight as he placed his hand on Lockhart's head and swirled it around. You said memory charm is your best charm, correct? So I think it will be fitting that I perform my first memory charm on you. And no, he please forgive me, Lockhart stuttered as he begged Quinn to let him go. You can keep the money. I promise I won't come here ever again. Please, let me go. Tut, 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 said Quinn as he shook Lockhart's head from side to side. Too late, I can't let you go anymore. Quinn grinned, and signs of mania were evident in his expression. And no, please let me go. Magic stimulated in Quinn's magical core as the memory charm got activated. I will erase everything about your job from your memory. Your only accomplishment in your life will be gone, smirked Quinn. He was going to erase knowledge about Lockhart's travel, the people he interviewed, how Lockhart's obliviated them to steal the credit, or that he was an author from Lockhart's memory. But then something happened. A curse triggered inside Hogwitz. An esoteric and abstruse curse placed on defense against dark arts teaching position activated. On the day Tom Marvolo Riddle slash Voldemort got turned down the defense against dark arts teaching position by Dumbledore a few years later, he placed a curse on the defense against dark arts position. The curse ensures that no defense against dark arts professor would stay for longer than a year. The curse slightly gave a nudge to Quinn's mind, which was already under the influence of another magic. A smirk so broad that it split Quinn's face appeared as he laughed. Screw it, let's go the canon way, which we know is all the way. Quinn's magic entered Lockhart's mind, rampaging inside it and erasing everything that made Gilderoy Lockhart, well, Gilderoy Lockhart. In a few seconds, the magic settled, and Quinn removed his hand, and Lockhart's head slumped forward. Quinn frowned and walked to Lockhart's front and lifted the newly obliviated man's head with his chin. Lockhart. Quinn called out. Quinn slapped the man on his cheeks, trying to wake him up. But the only response was some groaning. All right, everything is fine, Quinn beamed, and ropes over ropes covered Lockhart and propped him straight up on his feet. Let's go, Mr. Lockhart, Quinn smiled. Let's get you to your office. I know you will be more comfortable there. Lockhart's body floated up and turned, so it was horizontal to the ground. Another look from Quinn and Lockhart with ropes turned invisible. The boy hummed a happy tune as he skipped his way to Lockhart's office. On his nape, seven colors oscillated, shining with deep shades, giving the impression of deep entrenchment. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, S L O T H dash A C E D I A. Pink, L U S T dash L U X U R I A. Red, W R A T H dash I R A. Yellow, G R E E D dash A V A R I T I A. Violet, P R I D E dash S U P E R B I A. Green, E N V Y dash I N V I D I A. Orange, G L U T T O N Y dash dash G U L A. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, M C, colors, colors, what are you? Gilderoy Lockhart? Gilderoy Lockhart no more. Chapter 65, Madness, Chaos, and Silence Nights at Hogwarts were quiet with comfortable yet eerie silence. Students comfortably slept in their dorms, teachers who were off-duty either went out to Hogsmeade to enjoy some nightlife or stayed in for a quiet day. House elves performed tasks in the cover of the night. Portraits also went to sleep in their frames, emulating human behavior. Ghosts who were awake and couldn't sleep were few in numbers to bring life to the castle. In that quiet castle, a boy could be seen dancing in the Hogwarts castle as he moved in the corridors. He was doing nothing but taking a walk in the silent castle, feeling the cool breeze caress his skin. Today had been another good day in series of good days for him. Gilderoy Lockhart, the fraud, the person who had tried to wrong him by trying to erase his memories and take his memory, was stripped of his position as the professor of defense against dark arts. The official reason was that Gilderoy Lockhart had become sick and was quitting his job because of health reasons. But he knew better. Anyway, Gilderoy Lockhart had quit his job, and to soften the blow for his numerous fans, he had announced a sale for the next week, dubbing it the Get Well Soon Sale Week. The Lockhart goods were being sold at never-before-seen prices just so that his fans could show their support in the time of need. Even in his absence, Gilderoy Lockhart was giving him profits. A pity that he had to go. While he was dancing in the corridors, Recon, his trusty map, was floating in front of him, diligently doing its job to show who was present around him. His walks in the night were a private affair, and he preferred them to remain that way. With no people, elves, ghosts in his sight. 
He would occasionally look at the map, changing his direction if he was moving towards someone or they were moving towards him. It was polite to give people their space. And while they didn't know that he was here, he did know that others were around, so it was only normal to get out of their way so that both he and the other party could enjoy their peaceful night. When he looked at the map, he found someone ahead in his path. It was a blue dot, meaning that the other party was a student. A rare sight this late in the night. He was about to follow the usual protocol and avoid them, but the name tag with the blue dot caused him to still in his path. The map showed that Luna Lovegood was around the corner from him. This puzzled him greatly. Why was Luna here? She didn't stay up this late. It was past her bedtime, she had told him so. Worried about his friend, he moved towards the girl. Softly taking steps as he turned around the corner bend and saw her. She was standing there, at the side of the corner. Looking outside at the bright moon that was illuminating the velvety night sky, she looked like a fairy, admiring natural beauty in a way humans couldn't. But her appearance caused him to frown. She was wearing her Hogwarts robe. But there was nothing on her feet, barefoot were her solace. She looked fine, but that didn't say anything about why she was here so late in the night. So, after some contemplation, he called out. Luna. The younger girl had badgered him to call her by her first name, going as far as not responding to her family name. According to her, it was nice to hear Luna instead of Looney, like everybody had started to call her. The silvery blonde swirled her head towards the voice. There she saw him standing there, looking at her with a worried look on his face. Quinn, she said. Her feet moved, moving her body towards him. What are you doing here, Luna? Quinn, who saw Luna moving towards him, asked. It is past your bedtime. The blonde stopped in front of him and replied with questions of her own. What are you doing here? Why aren't you sleeping? Quinn's reply was a simple one. It is not my bedtime, so I am taking a walk. To Luna Lovegood, the answer was a fitting one. She got answers to both of her questions. So, tell me, young lady, why are you here and not in your bed, sleeping, asked Quinn. And, why aren't you wearing anything on your feet? Luna looked down at her feet, her toes moved in nervousness. She spoke softly. I was kicked out of the common room, and now I can't enter the common room. Quinn frowned at the answer. What do you mean you were kicked out of the common room? No person other than the faculty members could kick a student out of the house common room. And he was sure that Flitwick wouldn't kick a student out of the common room this late at night. Some seventh year girls came to my dorm room and stunned me, Luna answered while clutching the ends of her robe. When I came to be, I only had this robe on me and was in the first floor girls lavatory. Quinn's blood went cold as he heard that. She narrated her story straightforwardly with no cracks in her voice, but he could see the signs she displayed. She hadn't looked at his face ever since she walked near him. Her hands had been clutching her robe so hard that her hands were white. When I went to the common room, I couldn't answer the riddle from the eagle, and no one came in or out of the common room, so I was locked out. And, why didn't you go to Professor Flitwick or any other professor? Quinn asked. He successfully hid the anger he was feeling. I don't know Professor Flitwick's bedtime, she answered. Her face still facing downwards. What if I woke him up from sleep? Quinn closed because of the anger he was feeling. His anger rose again because even though Luna's words sounded idiotic, Quinn knew that Luna was scared to even ask for help. She was just saying this to hide the real reason. Luna, he spoke to the young girl in front of her. When she didn't look up, he used her hands to cup her cheeks, lifting her head up to such that she was looking at him. You don't have to be scared to ask for help. You can go to any professor, even if it is Professor Snape in the middle of the night. You can even knock on the headmaster's door, and it would be fine. Luna stared at Quinn as he spoke. And, you can come to me with any problems you have. He showed a comforting smile and spoke. You are my friend, and I always help my friends out. So, come to me anytime you want, and I would be waiting for you. Really? Asked Luna. Her eyes stared at Quinn as if looking for something. Really? Luna's chin quivered a little. She released her robes from her hands and raised them to hug Quinn. Her thin arms grabbed onto Quinn tightly. Quinn, who was surprised for a moment, snapped out of it and hugged back. He could feel her silent sobs and gently stroked her back and let her cry it out. Luna didn't have any friends in Hogwarts. Her quirky personality didn't help her make friends. She was friends with Ginny Weasley, but the Gryffindor girl was in another house and busy with her new friends. The two couldn't meet as frequently as they did before Hogwarts, leaving Luna alone. Quinn was Luna's friend, but he had been too busy himself. Spending his time in the restricted section of library, room of requirements, or the A.I.D office, he was rarely seen in the Ravenclaw common room. Luna would usually spend her time in the gardens exploring the greens by her lonesome. But she could only do it so much, and after that, any child would want someone to play with them. So, when Quinn heard that Luna could come to him anytime and that he was her friend, she broke down. When she woke up in the bathroom, she was scared and alone. It frightened her when she couldn't figure out the puzzle to go inside her common room. She was sure that she would have to spend the night, out, alone. Quinn waited for Luna to calm down before he spoke. Are you feeling fine? The girls in his arms nodded but didn't separate from him. Good, now let's get you home, said Quinn. It was too late in the night, and it was time to sleep. Even Quinn was feeling sleepy. It is late, and we should go sleep. Luna finally released him from her hug but grabbed the edge of his sleeve as if scared that Quinn would disappear if she let him go. The two walked in comfortable silence until they reached the common room entrance on the fifth floor. Quinn looked at the bronze eagle knocker and used it to knock on the door. 
Immediately the eagle spoke the entry riddle. A container without hinges, lock, or a key. Yet a golden treasure lies inside me. What am I? The answer from Quinn came immediately. An egg. Luna, on the side, finally understood the riddle, and her eyes shone when she heard the answer. There was no answer from the eagle, but Quinn and Luna knew the answer was correct when the door opened, allowing them entry to the common room. The two Ravenclaws stepped inside. When the pair reached the stairs to the girls' dormitory, Quinn made Luna face him and looked her into the eye and asked, Luna, tell me the names of the girls who stunned you. Luna's eyes widened before she shook her head, refusing to answer. Luna, I can help, Quinn tried to explain. We will go to Professor Flitwick together, and he will punish those girls. It will be fine. Luna still shook her head. She didn't want to go to the professor. Today terrified her, and she was afraid that if she complained, then the girls would do something terrible again. All right, sighed Quinn. He tried, but Luna didn't speak a single word. Now go up and sleep. I will be waiting for you here tomorrow morning. We will go to breakfast together, okay? Luna showed a sleepy smile and nodded. Good, now go sleep. Good night, Luna. Good night, Quinn. She gave Quinn one final hug before climbing the stairs to the girls' dormitory. Quinn waited for a while before all expression drained from his face. Sorry, Luna. He apologized. But, if you don't want to go to the professors, then I would have to take this matter into my own hands. He already knew the identity of the girls who bullied Luna. He had pulled the knowledge when he looked into the eyes using legilimency. The thing was that the splash of red was present on Quinn's nape from the second Luna told him about what happened to her. It only deepened in color with time, and Quinn only hid the anger because Luna didn't need anger but comfort from him. Maximum suffering, Quinn spoke in the empty common room. Scene break. The next few days, Quinn stalked the group of three seventh-year Ravenclaw girls. From his observations, the three girls were high up in the Ravenclaw social hierarchy. The three were below average on the Ravenclaw exam grading scale, which meant they were above average in the Hogwarts exam grading scale. Two of them had boyfriends, third had broken up with hers two months ago. Not a useful piece of information, but information nevertheless. What Quinn did in the few days was to find their daily routine. Find their usual routes, timings, people they sit and stand with. When they were in the common room, places they went to in their free time, he found things that would help him track them. This time around, Quinn didn't call in his favors to get some blackmail material because he wasn't looking to blackmail the girls. He was going to hurt them they did to Luna. Tit for tat was the theme. When Quinn thought that he had enough information and familiarity with their daily routine, he decided to strike. On the day he was planning to execute the plan, he went down inside his suitcase and retrieved an object that he would use against them. Quinn looked at the thing in his hand and smiled. Maximum suffering? He pocketed the thing and moved out. After spending the school day attending classes, he was finally free. So were the three girls. It was a Friday, and on Fridays, these three girls would go to one of the many secluded in Hogwarts with a bottle of fire whiskey and drink the fire-inducing booze, alone away from the eyes of anyone who could get them in trouble. Quinn chose this moment because the area they drank was secluded, and no one would be there to see Quinn or the girls. He could work without any witnesses, so no danger of him getting into trouble. The girls arrived in the secluded place full of boulders. Quinn waited behind an enormous boulder till they were settled down, and he was sure no one else was joining them. With his eyes on the girls, Quinn's hand went into his robes, and when it came out, he was holding something. He lifted his hand and pointed at the girls. His face had a savage grin on it. But then something happened, something clicked in Quinn's mind. Quinn looked at the object in his raised hand and stared at it. What? He thought. In his hand was the thing that he hadn't touched for more than two and a half years, close to three years. He had not looked at it for the same amount of time. And, the last time he was near it was before the school year started, but other than that, Quinn had no contact with the object. So, imagine his surprise when he found the object in his hand that he wasn't willing to touch other than the situation where things were on the level of Fubar. This situation was nowhere near the level of Fubar, but Quinn still had it in his hand. This told him one thing. Just having the object in his hand eliminated all other possibilities and left one single possibility. Which was, that something was wrong with him. Why did he come to this conclusion? It was because Quinn was pointing a wand at the girls. Not his fake wand that he made before his first year. The wand in his hand was the real deal. The wand in his hand was an olivander piece made from the wood of an acacia tree, with a phoenix's feather as the core, 14 inches and rigid flexibility. It was indeed like the calm before the storm. Quinn stayed still for a moment. In that stillness, a clarity befell upon Quinn, a clarity that felt strange to Quinn because he hadn't felt like this in months. It was like something clogging the back of his head was cleaned, and all motors were running smoothly again. Instinctively Quinn dove into his mind, and the first memory that popped into his mind was when he dropped unconscious in the second vault. From there on out, Quinn introspected the entire school term, and it finally became clear what he had done. All the things he did, which he would usually steer clear of. His attitude towards things, slight changes in his personality, and substantially lowered inhibitions. Time passed as Quinn stood in his hiding spot. It was like a basilisk had petrified him as three girls he was going to target drank the booze, had a fun time, and left the place. Finally, Quinn reached the part where he obliviated into forgetting everything about his identity, and now, as he looked at the real wand in his hand, Quinn's heart started to beat quicker. What have I done? 
Quinn's tone was grave and remorseful. What was I going to do with those girls? There was a clear sound of glass shattering in Quinn's mind. The sudden sound startled him, and he turned towards his back. And while there was no one behind him, Quinn's magic moved on its own and froze the rocks behind him. Huh. He didn't mean to use ice magic to freeze the rocks. It just happened on its own. Then Quinn heard the sound of sizzling behind him, and turning, he saw that half a boulder had been turned into dust. W. Watt. Suddenly, Quinn's hands felt hot, and when he looked down, he saw veins of blood magic on his forearm. At this point, Quinn was experiencing a full-blown panic attack, and with those erratic feelings, the magic around started to become more and more unstable. More and more of the area froze and melted at the same time. Rocks transfigured and transmuted before everything turned into dust or exploded. Lacerations and deep gashes made from destructive and dark magic appeared on the rocks and boulders around him. With labored breathing and sweating from all over Quinn's body, he looked around as his vision blurred and his ears buzzed. SST op, broken words came out of Quinn's mouth as he clutched his head and attempted to stop his magic from lashing out without his will. It took a while, but the magic stopped, leaving the horrid destruction around him. But, the trouble wasn't over as Quinn stood up on his feet and immediately ran inside the castle. He was holding magic, but he was hanging on a thread, and the magic, was pushing against his control, rampaging his body, threatening to break out. Quinn somehow got to the seventh floor. His entire journey to the seventh floor had been rough as some of his magic had leaked out, leaving patches of magical damage in his path. A strong room, a strong room, a strong room. Quinn desperately thought about wanting a strong room as he paced up and down to activate the room of requirement. When the door finally appeared, Quinn directly ran into the door, opening it with his body. He stumbled into the room of requirements, falling within a few unstable steps. A -a 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 -a. a scream pierced the room as Quinn finally couldn't stop the bubbling magic inside him, and instantly, the surrounding room shook. Whips of fire, layers of ice, streaks of lightning, quaking floor, lacerations, and cracks appeared along the walls and floor. The room descended into pandemonium as Quinn's magic wreaked chaos in the room while the room of requirement fixed the damages continuously. After an unknown period, Quinn gained some semblance of control. Quinn once again tried to stop his magic, which wasn't following his will and order, but nothing worked. It lashed out without his lead. Quinn had no control over his rampaging magic. Any effort to direct his magic was met with failure. The rapid expulsion of magic started to hurt his body as Quinn felt like his veins were on fire. In that desperate time, an idea struck him, and he reached into his mind. He used the emotional aspect of acclumency to reach out to all his turbulent emotions, and at that moment, he cut all his connections to his emotions. He disconnected his emotions from his body, and instantly his face went blank. Next went the emotional connection to his mind, and everything he was feeling become distant and like a buzzing in his mind, annoying but manageable. Finally, Quinn cut the emotional connection to his magic. His wandless focus ability heavily depended on emotions and his will to perform magic. The lack of magical focus made Quinn's emotions and will crucial to his ability to cast magic. Now, without a single ounce of emotional connection from Quinn, the magic stopped. The room went silent as Quinn sat on his knees, his hands hanging loosely to his sides. There was not an expression on his face or a look in his eyes. He opened his mouth, and words came out in a monotone. I screwed up. I need help. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Blue, S-L-O-T-H dash A-C-E-D-I-A. Pink, L-U-S-T dash L-U-X-U-R-I-A. Red, W-R-A-T-H dash I-R-A. Yellow, G-R-E-E-D dash A-V-A-R-I-T-I-A. Violet, P R I D E S U P E R B I A. Green, E N V Y I N V I D I A. Orange, G L U T T O N Y G U L A. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, M C. Fubar, Chapter 66. Grandfather and grandson talk. George West looked around the room he was in. It was a plain room that clearly been cleaned recently to make it presentable. Presentable to whom? His best and probably correct guess was for him. He owned the building of which the room was part. Actually, this building was owned by the West family business, and he was the owner of said business, so technically, he owned this building. Back to the room, he was in, it had a single wooden table and two chairs, sitting opposite to each other on opposite sides of the table. On the table rested a pitcher of water with two glasses, courtesy of the manager of the small, West-financed ventures operated in the building. There was no decor on the walls, and the walls were painted in a simple white color that looked dull because of the time it had been since the room was given a coat of paint. Other than the table and the chairs, the room was bare. He got and walked to the window and looked outside the window. Through the glass, he could see the view of the all-wizard Hogsmeade village. People who lived in the settlement went on with their lives as George watched them from above. Not knowing that the richest man in the country was looking at them, George thought of the reason he was here. Quinn, his younger grandchild, had sent him a mail through the machine they were calling Magi Fax. The Magi Fax was a big hit in the offices of the West business. In the past year, Magi Fax was introduced to almost all of the West family offices and ventures. And as it was expected, the addition of the machines was a big hit everywhere. The memos were being sent faster than ever before. Just by employing the instantaneous feature of the Magi Fax, the business all around the world had gained major profits. 
the information was being exchanged much faster than their local competitors, that West Business was faster and better at everything because they had more time to plan and act. George smiled when he thought about the profits that the Magi Fax brought them. Soon, the Magi Fax would be rolled out for all to buy and bring in more profits. His grandson, Quinn, didn't know it, but George had opened an account for him that would hold a part of the profit for every Magi Fax sold. His grandson didn't know it, but he was about to get very rich in the coming future. George walked back to his chair and sat down. He didn't know why Quinn had called him here at the Scriven Shaft's Quill Shop at Hogsmeade, but the letter said that he needed to get here as quickly as possible even if it meant to drop everything he was doing. George did what he was asked for and immediately replied that he would meet him the next day, and here he was, sitting in a room in Hogsmeade, waiting for his grandson to arrive. But, today isn't a Hogsmeade weekend, murmured George. He had asked the shop manager, and he was told that today, a Saturday, wasn't marked as a Hogsmeade weekend. I wonder how Quinn will get out of the castle. George didn't know that there were hidden passages to get in and out of the castle, and Quinn knew every one of them. He picked up a glass from the tray and placed it on the table, took out his wand, and cleaned it himself with magic before pouring himself a glass of water. Just as his glass was full, the door to the room opened. George looked up to see his grandson, Quinn, standing at the door. Grandfather, greeted Quinn. George noticed the flat tone in which Quinn spoke and the slump in Quinn's shoulders, and the tiredness in his posture. Quinn, you look. George greeted back but couldn't finish his sentence as there was something off about Quinn. George couldn't know what it was, but something about Quinn looked unnatural. Quinn sat down on the opposite chair and looked at George. When the eyes met each other, George's widened when the unnatural feeling disappeared, but what remained wasn't what George was expecting. George saw Quinn's face distort, and gone was the unnatural feeling and what remained was heavy bags under Quinn's eyes and sickeningly pale skin. His tired face didn't have an expression on it. Quinn. George exclaimed in worry as he reached out his hands towards Quinn's face and held it against his cheek. Oh my dear child, what happened to you? Quinn stared at George with the same expressionless face he had on since the last two days and spoke monotonously. I got into trouble. I am in big trouble and need help. George frowned in worry as he noticed the monotone in Quinn's voice and no expression. Quinn, why are you using a clumency to hide your emotions? After another stare, Quinn spoke, please, step back and keep your wand at ready. What? George was confused. Quinn's words didn't answer his question. His words only confused him more and caused more worry. If you push your chair back and make some distance between us, I would be properly able to explain what is happening. The flat tone seemed to be the only tone that Quinn spoke in. And, please keep your wand ready to protect yourself. He stared into George's eyes and asked, do you understand? George observed Quinn with a critical eye before following his grandson's instruction. He pushed his chair away from the table and readied his wand to defend himself. I am going to undo my acclumency. Quinn's voice cracked a little. Be ready. George didn't know what to expect, but what happened blew his mind. A pained expression appeared on Quinn's face. It was the first facial expression he had shown since entering the room. Then it all started. The walls of the room changed. Some of the patches of the wall turned into liquid and dripped. Spikes jutted out from other patches. Paint on the wall caught on fire, but at the same time, the walls became whiter than ever. George gripped his wand as he felt the room getting colder and colder, but when he looked up at the ceiling, it was on fire. The table shook violently before floating up in the air. Deep gashes and horrid laceration tortured the floor. George removed his eyes from the bizarreness around, looked at Quinn, and saw multicolored veins all over his face. The rampant magic stopped after 10 seconds, leaving a panting Quinn, who slowly went back to becoming expressionless within the following few seconds. The room, on the other hand, didn't go back to normal. It remained damaged from Quinn's magic. Please do damage control, came Quinn's request in the same monotone. George didn't respond for several seconds and just stared at Quinn before he finally used magic to extinguish the fires, repairing the destroyed table and fixing the walls to a certain degree. The room didn't go back to before Quinn's magic bruised it, but it was much better than the mess when Quinn cut the emotional connection from his magic. What happened, George pulled his chair towards the table and put his hand on Quinn's hand, which was shivering. What was that? Quinn held George's hand. George felt the nervousness in the grip. Then, I should start from the beginning. Quinn pulled his hand back and took out a wooden cuboid from his clothes, and placed it in the middle of the table. The cuboidal box had crude runes carved on its surface. What is this? Quinn stared at the box with a blank expression, but no one but him knew what was going inside his mind. Inside that wooden block is my wand. George frowned as he asked, your wand. He couldn't comprehend why Quinn would keep his wand in a wooden box. He wasn't expecting the answer that Quinn gave him. Grandfather, I have only held my wand two times since the day I bought it. The first time was on the day we bought the day and the second time was before this week. Other than those two times, I haven't touched the wand with any part of my body. That doesn't make sense, George spoke, not believing what Quinn said because his situation didn't allow Quinn to leave his wand. Child, you are learning magic, you can't perform magic without a wand. Quinn's hands were palm faced down on the table. He slightly raised his index finger on his right hand, and immediately George's wand expelled from his hand and twirled in the air before falling over the table. I don't need a wand to use magic. George looked at his wand on the table, which was snatched from his hands. He couldn't believe that an unarmed child had just disarmed him. 
Then came the story that explained to George what just happened. Grandfather, if you remember, I showed my first sign of magic when I was four there was a pause before Quinn continued again, when I fell from my room's window, and that triggered the accidental magic to save my life. George, of course, remembered the day. All the people had a scare followed by joy because of Quinn's fall. It was exactly one year after that I gained deliberate control over my magic, Quinn narrated the event where he first used magic. It was frustration-induced, accidental magic. I sent a rubber ball across the room. That allowed me to control my magic on smaller levels. Quinn remembered the days he would play with glass marbles and rubber balls. I moved small objects by using magic for an entire year before I got my hands on one of Leah's books. If Quinn didn't have a tight grasp on his occlumency, he would have smiled. From that day onwards, I learned about magic theory and how it worked. George recalled the days when Quinn would carry Leah's book with him all around the house. Then came the time when he left for the world tour. That was the start of my magical journey. Leah had given me books of my own as a gift, and I had you buy books from every country we visited. Unlike what everybody thought I didn't buy them because I enjoyed reading, I bought them because I wanted to learn more about my magic. George's eyes widened at the revelation. He couldn't believe that his grandson had been doing wandless magic since he was five years old. I learned on that trip. To this day, I consider those years were the best time of my life. I traveled the world while learning magic. At that time, it was everything I wanted from my life. I never stopped practicing magic after that. Quinn stared at George's face and continued, I have over eight years, closer to nine years of experience with wandless magic. I can use magic without a focus with no problems. I don't even notice it anymore. Quinn stopped talking to let George absorb the information. After a while, George put up a question. Why didn't you use your wand after we bought it for you? Memories of the day he bought his wand passed through Quinn's mind, as I said, I had been using magic without a focus since I was five years old. That was six years of experience of wandless magic. By that time, I had a solid connection to my magic. But when I held the wand, what it did was try to divert the connection between me and my magic through the wand. Meaning that if I kept using my magic, then there would come the point where I would reach a point where I would have to use the wand as a link between me and my magic. Quinn did a robotic shrug as he explained, I didn't want my solid connection to my magic to wither away with time. But the wand made me feel so powerful. Just holding the wand in my hand increased my magical capabilities by several levels. I struggled with the temptation of the power it made me feel, so to escape it, I locked the wand in a wood block and threw it in one of the rooms in my suitcase. George couldn't understand what Quinn was talking about as magic theory wasn't his forte. But, George did have another question for Quinn. Quinn, he looked at his grandson with a slightly hurt look on his face. Why did you think you needed something like this hidden from me or anyone in the family? Seeing the hurt look on George's face shook Quinn. He almost lost control over his occlumency. The look of vulnerability was not something he had seen on George's face. The older man always had a stern and stoic exterior. Quinn knew that George was a caring person, but the hurt expression on his face something Quinn had never seen before. There was a long pause before Quinn replied. I didn't tell anyone because I thought you would stop me from using magic. Quinn was grateful for the occlumency that kept his magic at bay because it made his voice sound absolutely flat with no emotion in it. If Quinn wasn't using occlumency right now, he wasn't sure if he would have been able to lie to George. It was a complete lie when Quinn said that he thought they would stop him from using magic. The real reason was something entirely different. The five-year-old Quinn didn't consider the Wests as his family. He didn't trust them even a single bit. He didn't see George West as his grandfather, nor did he see Leah West as his sister. He was dropped in this world with no warning. He had suffered from a panic attack within minutes of coming to this world. Quinn found himself in an unfamiliar body and lived in a house with the original Quinn's family. At that point in time, they were complete strangers to him. And, they weren't any strangers, who were family to the original owner of this body, who was now dead. He didn't dare to reveal that he could do magic without a magical focus because it scared him that they would somehow know that he wasn't their family and just somebody possessing their family member's body. If they ever found out, he was sure that he would be dead, with no one ever finding of his death. It was the reason why he acted as the perfect child so that they won't get suspicious. Quinn did what every child would do and behaved as a well-behaved child so that they won't have any reason to become suspicious. For the first two years, Quinn wore a permanent mask of a perfectly behaved child. A method actor as he had once called himself. It was all an act to maintain his life in this world. It took time before Quinn learned to see them as his family. It took spending years with them to finally see them as his family. To finally look at George West as his grandfather, Leah West as his sister, Elliot Dalton, and Ms. Rosie as his all-but-in-blood family, and Polly as the dependable house elf who completed his family. It took time to finally consider himself as a genuine member of the West family and not some imposter. But by the time he finally accepted them, it was already had been years since he started practicing magic. He felt guilty for not telling them and decided to keep it a secret until he got a good chance to reveal that he could do magic without a wand. Losing control over his magic wasn't the lemon he imagined about, but it was the one that life gave him, so he made lemonade with it. There was a long silence between George and Quinn as they stared at each other. Neither of the two said a single word. I am sorry, spoke Quinn. He apologized for being so late. I am sorry for hiding it this long. 
I will not lie and say that it didn't hurt me to see that you thought I would stop you from doing something you so clearly loved, George spoke, his voice softer than Quinn had ever heard from the man. But I am glad that you told me about this. And Quinn, I would say this, I would never ever stop you from doing what you love. Thank you, said Quinn. But, this still doesn't explain why you are in this condition, asked George. While his talk with his grandson had brought them together, it said nothing about the condition Quinn was currently in. What happened to you that you lost control of magic? Quinn poured himself a glass of water from the slightly deformed pitcher before continuing. There exist a few secret mysteries in Hogwarts that not many know about. Quinn was starting the cursed vault's explanation to his grandfather. The castle is a thousand years old with generations of magical humans starting their magical journey with Hogwarts. So, it is not strange that there are unidentified areas in the castle. I just so happened to come across one of those mysteries. Quinn reminisced about the day he met Friar and how it changed his life in Hogwarts. In my second year at Hogwarts, I found that there are these five vaults hidden across Hogwarts. Only the ghosts remember about them because some of them have been here for centuries. The Hufflepuff ghost, Friar, shared with me the knowledge about these vaults. George listened to Quinn, who spoke with a flat tone and blank expression, but George could see how these vaults would have excited Quinn. I cleared the first vault last year. There was a pause in which Quinn thought if he should tell George about how he got hospitalized for 10 days because he almost died. Quinn decided that if he was going to tell George about the vaults, then he should just opt for full disclosure, sort of. I got hospitalized for 10 days, had to grow most of my skin, all of my hair, heal my bones and plenty of organs. What? George screamed. Why wasn't I told about this? Quinn expected that reaction. He was just glad that he didn't use the words like death or almost died in his sentence. It was nothing to worry about. Quinn lied to lessen his grandfather's worries. Madame Pomfrey fixed me up in no time. Plus, she is a great company. Moving on, I solved the first vault and found what was behind it. No problems, it just took a lot of time and effort. Quinn looked George in the eyes. The problem started this year when I found the second vault, and in my first and only exploration of the vault, I fell unconscious. George sharply inhaled. He didn't like where this was going. Quinn took a deep breath before continuing. Something happened to me that day, and whatever happened was undone before this week because I now have no control over my magic. Quinn's hand shivered as some emotions started leaking. I went from feeling on the top of my game to having no control over my magic. It actively tries to escape my body and cause rampage. George could feel that Quinn was struggling because he could feel the slight temperature dropping in the room, and there were small glimmers of facial expression on Quinn's face. He took Quinn's hand in his and spoke. But, you just used magic when you disarmed me. Quinn shook his head and explained. I can still do minor magic that I find easy. My magic is seriously limited right now. Plus, right now, I feel stifled when I use magic. Using magic without a connection to my will feels extremely wrong. He pointed to the time just a few minutes ago. You remember when I come into this room, I was hiding my face with magic? That was illusion magic, at least a physical illusion, not a mental illusion. I am not in the condition to perform much mental magic, and your acclumency defenses are too much for even the normal me to use a mental illusion. Quinn looked at George's face and realized that he had gotten off the point. Ah, anyway, I saw your face and noticed that you found something wrong. The current me wasn't able to pull off a physical illusion with my magical capabilities. I am not having a good time with my magic. I don't feel good. It is alright, Quinn, George spoke in a comforting voice. Everything would be alright. I will find a way to fix whatever is wrong with you. So, don't worry. Everyone in the house would help. George meant it as he already started to plan to hire the best healers money could buy. He needed to find the best in the fields and provide his grandson with the best health care. Help? Yes, help. Quinn's eyes shined, and he gripped George's hands. I need help with this, and you can help me with this. Of course, anything you want, Quinn. George didn't deny any request. While he couldn't see any expression on Quinn's face, he could tell that something was wrong with Quinn. His emotions were all over the place. I want you to call someone, Quinn said. I want you to get them to West Manor the day I return home. The request confused George. He didn't know who his grandson wanted to meet so eagerly. Who is it? Quinn took another deep breath before speaking in a flat monotone. I want you to call Alan D. Baddeley. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, more stone-faced than a certain blonde. George West, grandfather, extremely worried about his grandson. Chapter 67, De Petrified, Unknown Stabber, and Marauder's Map. It was weird to wake up from petrification, thought Ivy Potter as she looked at the hospital wing ward from her bed. One moment she was looking around the corner through mirrors just to make sure there wasn't a gigantic snake waiting for her, but then she saw acid yellow eyes in the mirror, and everything went black. The advice saved her life even though she didn't like the source of the said advice. She was miffed that she was taken out twice in a single day, once by Quinn West and then by the Basilisk later that day. It was a weird thought to have after being petrified and coming as close to death as she had been, but for Ivy, those events were the last memories she had before the petrification. There was no fear or dread when she was petrified as the petrification from Basilisk was instant. It didn't give Ivy a chance to feel anything at all. Sure she woke up with a slight scream of terror because she could remember the Basilisk, but what she saw was her mother standing by her bed, hugging her tightly. Ah, she was petrified, were her thoughts. 
It felt almost anticlimactic, being petrified by the deadliest snake in the world. The only thing she didn't like was the stiffness in her body from no activity for weeks, but Madame Pomfrey cured it in a jiffy. Ivy's first worry came when she remembered Hermione was with her and asked what happened to her best friend. She was told that the students were being released from their petrified state one every half hour so that Madame Pomfrey could have ample time to check if something was wrong before moving on to the next student. Ivy was the second last to be cured, and Hermione was after her, making Hermione the last student to be given the mandrake juice. The bushy-haired witch's first reaction was funny. She woke with a yell of bullocks. That was something Ivy wasn't expecting from a person who always chided Ron for his language. Then Ivy was told that the heir of Slytherin took her into the Chamber of Secrets. Harry and Ron had gone in there to save her. It made her feel grateful to her brother and childhood friend. The two dummies had ventured into the Chamber of Secrets just for her. There was no way that her heart didn't feel warm for the two. She forgave them for being so annoying all the time. Then came the tough part where the now reinstated headmaster told the students before them that the Slytherin's monster had petrified them for months. It wasn't a nice thing to see when Colin Creevy found he had lost a big chunk of his first year at Hogwarts or when Susanna Heseldon found she missed out on crucial time in school during her O.W.L year. Justin Finch Fletchley yelled that they should kick her brother Harry out of Hogwarts. But the headmaster explained to him that Harry wasn't the heir of Slytherin and the whole incident was because of a dark magic artifact that opened the Chamber of Secrets but didn't go into detail. Ivy thought that she and Hermione were lucky because they were only out for a few weeks and didn't lose time on the level as the others did. Scene break. Ivy, Hermione, Harry, and Ron sat huddled in Harry's bed in the Gryffindor boys' dormitory. The curtains around the poster bed were drawn, providing privacy to the Golden Squad. It was the first time since Ivy and Hermione were waken up from petrification that the four had sat down together to talk about what happened. Let's start, Ivy spoke to her friends. She was leaning against the headboard of the bed. Tell us what happened down in the chamber. Harry and Ron looked at each other before Harry started telling the events that transpired. We found the parchment in Hermione's clutches and immediately found the information about the basilisk in it. Then there was the note on it which said that Moaning Myrtle knew about the location of the Chamber of Secrets. Then it clicked in my head, Harry explained, that if the basilisk could kill with its gaze, then the what if the girl who died the last time the Chamber of Secrets was opened never left the place which she died. What if she was there the whole time? Ivy and Hermione's eyes widened as they understood. Harry, who saw the expression, nodded. Moaning Myrtle was the girl killed by the basilisk last time the Chamber of Secrets was opened, Harry recalled the conversation he had with the ghost. Ron, who was on the side, nodded. Myrtle said that she was crying in a stall when she heard a boy making strange sounds while Myrtle was in the lavatory and when Myrtle stepped out, all Myrtle saw were big yellow eyes before she died. Hermione had a strange thought that she decided to put out. Do you think glasses provide protection against basilisk's glare? Hermione asked, wondering about the information Quinn had given her and Ivy. I mean, look at all of us who got petrified, we all saw the basilisk's eyes indirectly. Shouldn't meeting the basilisk's eyes through the glass count as looking at it indirectly? Ivy shook her head in disapproval, I don't think so. In every case this time, the basilisk's eyes were seen through reflections. Water, mirrors, and viewfinder, all of which showed reflections of the eyes. And, Creevy saw the basilisk through a ghost, I don't think we can take ghost bodies and glasses as the same thing. She looked at Harry and thought of something. And, even if glasses do provide protection against death by glare, then I don't think Myrtle was wearing glasses at that time. Hermione frowned and questioned, why do you think that? Myrtle's ghost always has glasses on, which means she had glasses when she was alive. Harry said that she was crying when she was in the lavatory, Ivy jutted her chin towards Harry and said, I have seen him cry, he always removes his glasses when he cries, I mean, doesn't everyone who wears glasses remove their glasses when they cry, so, it is reasonable to think that Myrtle wasn't wearing her glasses at that time, Harry, who was telling them the ordeal he went through, was flabbergasted when the two girls started to talk about him crying, how did they go from basilisk and chamber of secrets to him crying, alright, stop talking about me crying, I don't cry, Harry said so that they could move on from the current topic and spoke the last words with some weight as if insisting on them. Let's move on. Ivy and Hermione giggled while Ron chuckled as he looked at his best mate. Harry felt heat rush to his cheeks and hurriedly spoke. So, when we asked about what she saw that day, Myrtle pointed at the sink right in front of the toilet she haunts. And, when we searched the sink, Ron found a tap with a snake on it. Harry gave Ron a thumbs up before turning back to the girls and revealed, There is something that you don't know about this year is that I have been hearing voices. Harry winced when he saw Hermione and Ivy glared at him. Ivy massaged her temple and spoke in a voice that clarified that she was holding back her anger. I have said this a lot through the year, and I can stress this enough, but you are really an idiot? Do you know what you just dash? If you had just told us dash. Ivy and Hermione had gone into Quinn West's office and got caught by him and were blackmailed into being under his debt. Ivy was sure that either she or Hermione would have figured out the monster's identity with that piece of information. And while Ivy didn't know if she would have broken into Quinn West's space, Ivy was sure she wouldn't have asked West for the monster's identity, and that would have saved her from doing a job for him. Harry remained quiet for a while and observed his two female friends. He waited for them to come down before continuing. 
Well, then I spoke to the tap in parcel tongue, and the whole sink came disappeared and left behind a huge hole which was the entrance to a tunnel that I think went down below Hogwitz. He remembered the entire tunnel ride into the Chamber of Secrets, with him trying to stifle his screams and Ron loudly screaming as he slid behind him. When I reached the Chamber of Secrets, I saw an unconscious student there. Harry stopped to recall his name. His name is Terence Higgins, a Slytherin. Ivy and Hermione noticed Harry didn't show his usual reaction when he talked about Slytherin. Harry would show signs like a shallow frown or a wrinkled of his nose, but right now, he didn't show any of those. Even Ron didn't snort in derision or snarl things like bloody snakes. Ivy even saw light sympathy in her twin's eyes. That was new, she thought. So, Terence Higgins was the heir of Slytherin, Hermione asked the question. Harry shook his head and revealed. No, Higgins wasn't the heir of Slytherin, he looked at the two girls and spoke, Voldemort was the heir of Slytherin. Ivy and Hermione's eyes widen at the revelation. What do you mean Voldemort was the heir of Slytherin? Hermione's voice fully expressed her shock. Terence Higgins was being controlled by Voldemort. Voldemort possessed him and opened the Chamber of Secrets and released the Basilisk. Hermione was still frowning as she asked, but, how did he possess Higgins? A haunted look flashed on Harry's face as he explained, he used Tom Riddle's diary to possess Terence Higgins. What do you mean? Harry got up from his bed and walked to his desk. He picked up a piece of parchment and quill from his table and wrote something on it. After staring at the parchment for a while, he returned to the bed. The parchment went to the middle of the bed. Ivy, Hermione, and Ron leaned forward to look at the parchment. Asterisk. Tom Marvallo Riddle. I am Lord Voldemort. Asterisk. Every letter of the first line was connected to the letters of the second line with arrowed lines. Ivy, Hermione, and Ron were shocked to see the words transform into Voldemort's name. An anagram, gasped Hermione. Yes, Tom Riddle was Voldemort, Harry's face was pale as he stared at the parchment. There was a memory of Tom Riddle in that diary which could manipulate people who wrote on it. The other three understood what that meant. Harry had that diary for some time, and in that time, he had become withdrawn and something of a recluse. Harry was under the control of Tom Riddle's diary, and they could see how that knowledge was affecting Harry. A slight change in events, and Harry could have been lying in the chamber instead of Terence Higgins. Tom Riddle was the one who opened the chamber the last time, Harry told them about the memories that Riddle had shown him. He didn't want Hogwarts to close because of Myrtle's death, so he blamed Hagrid for it, and everyone believed it because of Aragog. Harry then proceeded to tell them about his struggle with the Basilisk and how Fox, the Phoenix, helped him by blinding the Basilisk and how the Sorting Hat gave him the Sword of Gryffindor. Fox cried on my wound and healed them and then burst into flames. I was so scared that he died, but it turned it was just a burning day. It is normal for Phoenixes, and Fox had exerted himself enough to trigger a rebirth from ashes. The other three listened with silent attention, taking in every word coming out of Harry's mouth. It wasn't every day when they heard a tale from a person who fought the Basilisk and lived to tell the fable. What happened after that? Asked Ron, engrossed in the story. Oh, then I passed out. You passed out. The same sentence came from the mouth of the three listeners. Harry scratched the back of his head and ruffled. Well, I had just been bitten by a Basilisk after I drove a sword through its head. I think it is normal for anyone to pass out after that. But what happened to the young Voldemort? Did he escape? Asked Ivy. Harry shook his head and revealed something that surprised all. That is the thing. When I woke up to Baby Fox's loud chirps, I saw that Riddle's diary had a Basilisk fang stabbed into the diary. Harry said the sentence like he couldn't figure it out. Riddle said that he was going to use Higgin to come back to life, but when I woke up, he was still alive, and Riddle wasn't anywhere to be seen. But, that doesn't mean that Voldemort is gone. What if he escaped? What is he is out there right now, exclaimed Ivy. Voldemort being out there scared her a lot. Harry shook his head and refuted Ivy's worries, Professor Dumbledore told me that when the diary was stabbed with the Basilisk Fang, the memory of Tom Riddle inside was destroyed. He assured me that Tom Riddle didn't return to life. He was destroyed with the diary. Ivy, Hermione, and Ron breathed a sigh of relief at that. Dumbledore's assurance was all they needed to believe that Voldemort wasn't returning as Tom Riddle. What I don't understand is that who stabbed the diary. There wasn't anyone in the chamber other than Riddle and I. Harry glanced at Ron and said. Neither did Ron see anyone entering the chamber. Ivy and Hermione shot quick and discreet glances at each other. Someone entered the chamber, he says, which meant that someone knew the chamber's location. And, both of them knew someone who fit that description. Scene break. Hey, Ivy, muttered Hermione as the two climbed down the stairs from the boys' dormitory to the common room. Do you think? It might be him, answered Ivy, but we can't be sure. It could be entirely someone else. Both girls knew who they were talking about. The person who had given them the information about the Basilisk knew the chamber's location. I am sure that even if we asked him, he would deny everything, added Ivy. Hermione nodded at that. What about the payment? What do we about it? The two girls exited the staircase as Ivy answered. We need to get West what he wanted. I don't know what he will do if we don't get him the Marauder's Map. She jutted her chin across the common room and spoke, and we are going to do it now. Hermione looked in the direction Ivy pointed at and saw the Weasley twins huddled together in one corner. The two walked over to the twins, and Ivy spoke. Fred, George, we need to talk. Weasley twins looked up from whatever they were doing and spoke in their usual twin speak. 
Ivy, Hermione, what can we do for you today? Ivy wasted no time and got to the point. I want you to give me the Marauder's Map. The identical twins made identical expressions of surprise. They looked at each other before staring at Ivy and asked, Why do you want the map? No, let us ask, how did you know about the map? Ivy sighed as she answered, My father is part of Marauders. He told me about the map. Now, give it to me. The Weasley twins' jaw dropped as I stunned them at the sudden revelation. James Potter, Senior Auror, is a Marauder. You must be joking. No, he is Prongs. Do you know about that name, she said, giving them proof her father was a part of the Marauders. The twins nodded in unison and perfect coordination. Good, so now give me the map. I really need it. Fred, or maybe it was George, took out a folded parchment from his pocket and handed it to Ivy. The daughter of Prongs took the parchment and awkwardly stared at it as she didn't know what it was. She licked her lips before asking the twins. Dad didn't tell me what it was or how it works, she spoke. Tell me about it. Ah, uh, I should have given this more thought, she thought simultaneously. Fred took the map from Ivy's hands and laid it on the floor. He gestured his twins and the girls to stand facing towards the wall to create a barrier. This, Ivy, is the secret of our success, said Fred, patting the parchment, fondly. It's a wrench, giving it to you, said George, but your father did make it, so we guess it can't be helped. Anyway, we know it by heart, said Fred. We bequeath it to you. We don't really need it anymore. Ivy and Hermione noticed that the twin speak had gone down. Even though they spoke in turns, they weren't completing each other's sentences. The map must be genuinely important to them, she thought. Ah, we got emotional, said George, wiping an imaginary tear with his finger. Explain, Fred. Well, when we were in our first year, Ivy, young, carefree, and innocent dash. Ivy snorted. She doubted whether Fred and George had ever been innocent. Well, more innocent than we are now, we got into a spot of bother with Filch. We let off a dung bomb in the corridor, and it upset him for some reason dash so, he hauled us off to his office and started threatening us with the usual dash dot. Detentions, disembowelment. It was then dash, we couldn't help noticing a drawer in one of his filing cabinets marked confiscated and highly dangerous. Don't tell me dash gasped Hermione. Ivy gave her friend a side look, the rule abiding witch had stolen from Snape, why was she acting so shocked now? Not that I am the one to talk, thought Ivy, having stolen from Filch. George caused a diversion by dropping another dung bomb. I whipped the drawer open and grabbed, this pointing at the folded parchment. It's not as bad as it sounds, you know, said George. We don't reckon Filch ever found out how to work it. He probably suspected what it was, though, or he wouldn't have confiscated it. And you know how to work it, asked Ivy, getting curious about the parchment's functionality. Oh yes, said Fred, smirking. This little beauty's taught us more than all the teachers in this school. Get to the point, sighed Ivy. George smiled as he took out his wand, touched the parchment lightly, and said, I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. And at once, thin ink lines began to spread like a spider's web from the point that George's wand had touched. They joined each other, they crisscrossed, they fanned into every corner of the parchment, then words began to blossom across the top, great, curly words, that proclaimed. Messrs. Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs purveyors of aids to magical mischief makers are proud to present Dash. The Marauder's Map. It was a map showing every detail of the Hogwarts castle and grounds. But the truly remarkable thing was the tiny ink dots moving around it, each labeled with a name in minuscule writing. Astounded, Ivy and Hermione bent over it. A labeled dot in the top left corner showed that Professor Dumbledore was pacing his study, the caretaker's cat, Mrs. Norris, was prowling the second floor, and Peeves, the poltergeist, was currently bouncing around the trophy room. And as Ivy's eyes traveled up and down the familiar corridors, she noticed something else. This map showed a set of passages she had never entered. Hidden passages are littered around Hogwitz, said Fred and George continued for him, passages that go out to Hogsmeade, or passages that connect different parts of the castle. Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs, sighed George, patting the heading of the map. We owe them so much. Noblemen, working tirelessly to help a new generation of lawbreakers, said Fred solemnly. Right, said George briskly. Don't forget to wipe it after you've used it dash or anyone can read it, Fred said warningly. Just tap it again and say, mischief managed. And it'll go blank. Ivy traced her finger on the map as if trying to find someone, and finally, her finger stopped on the fifth floor, in the west corner, at a certain classroom. Quinn West. George saw Ivy's finger stopping on Quinn's name. Ah, little Lord West dash the information broker, the all-knowing Ravenclaw completed Fred. Now that I remember, he knows about the map, doesn't he, my less handsome twin? Yes, he does. It was a big surprise, wasn't it? Ivy looked at them with shock and said, you two know that he knows about the map. Oh, yes. We don't know how West knows about it dash but he does. It was a surprise back then, but now, dash now it just seems normal given that he seems to know everything. Fred and George had plenty of interaction with the Quinn West. They regularly employed Quinn West for testing out their trick potions. It was a boon for them because they didn't need to check the trick slash prank potions on themselves. The twins didn't know how he did it, but Quinn West would modify the potion recipes and return recipes that would be better than before and perfectly safe to consume with no lasting effects. Perfect for prank potions. We occasionally have tried to follow him dash but he would always slip away from us. 
He probably knows the castle dash as well as we do. The twins saluted and said in unison, we can respect that. So, young ladies, said Fred, in an uncanny impersonation of Percy, mind you behave yourself. See you girls later, said George, winking. The twins bounced away, leaving behind Ivy and Hermione with the map with them. It was time to go back to the place they were held captive and talk to the devil. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Harry Potter, boy who lived, after being bitten by the basilisk, that is. Ron Weasley, didn't do much, but, props for bravery. Ivy Potter, nanny intensifies, obtained Marauder's map x1. Hermione Granger, unpetrified, bullocks, Fred and George, Weasley twins. Goodbye, map, man, they are superb guys, aren't they? Chapter 68, Payment, Simple, and returning home even though she had only been to this part of the fifth floor twice, it was one of her least favorite places in Hogwarts. The first time she had been here, Ivy had gotten help, and the host had been pleasant enough, and she had gotten what she wanted with something little extra for a great price. It was just that the parting had been a mixture of shock and surprise. The second time, she had come to do something not so ethical, and the results were not the ones she was expecting. She would still groan and sigh for several minutes after remembering the events that had transpired and she sincerely considered that it wasn't wholly her fault. Quinn West had shown so many signs of suspicious activity, yet, he had brought that on himself. Now, here she was for the third time, standing at the door of the same classroom turned office, her hand on the doorknob of the entrance. She genuinely didn't want to enter the room. Ivy could feel the stare of her best friend from her side and muttered, All right, all right, just give me a second. You already had two minutes worth of seconds, replied Hermione in a slightly exasperated tone. If you don't want to, I can take the lead. He did ask us both to get the map. Shaking her head, Ivy replied, no, I asked for the information, and the map belongs to my dad. I need to deal with this. You are overthinking it, you know? Think back to the time when we came here for the notes. The exchange at that time was simple. Hermione sighed at her friend's actions. We gave him money and got the notes and the information on the Philosopher's Stone. There was no stunning and being bound to chairs. But, what if tells us to do something? Ivy looked worried. Quinn had said that he might make her do something that she was uncomfortable with. And, we can't really refuse him after all that happened. Again, we can do nothing about it. If West wanted us to do something, he would have found us to collect his favors. Hermione shrugged and even though she didn't like someone having her under their control, she had given this situation some thought. It is inevitable, he will ask for something one day, might as well worry about it when the problem comes. No reason to waste time by worrying about it right now. Hermione gave Ivy a push and asked Ivy to open the door and enter the door. The redhead pursed her lips before opening the door with determination. Inside the office, the two girls saw Quinn West sitting behind his table. His eyes were closed, and there was no expression on his face. He was sitting so still that they thought he was a statue. But, the door chime on the top of the door alerted Quinn of their presence as he opened his eyes and saw the visitors. He showed no change in expression and just stared at them. No, he was observing them. Yes, he asked with a flat tone. Ivy, who was walking towards the table, frowned when she saw Quinn. She could see the telltale signs that he was using that. What are you doing? She asked. The question was vague, and Hermione, who was just behind her, frowned. Is she again going to start something? Hermione's experience while Ivy and Quinn West interacted was full of situations like this. Ivy would act recklessly and ask questions that stumped Hermione. She wanted nothing out of the ordinary to happen this time around and just wanted to quickly complete the transaction and get out of here. You know what I am doing, exactly. Quinn's reply came in the same flat tone and no expression. Ivy's eyes narrowed, and she asked back, I know what you are doing. What I meant was, why now? Drop it, it is unsettling. I am practicing, said Quinn. Not my fault you find it unsettling. Deal with it. Hermione was part confused, part confused, and part irritated. It was always like this. Whenever these two meet, she was sidelined. What are you two talking about? He is using a clumency, came the reply. Hermione didn't know what a clumency was, so it still didn't clear Hermione's confusion. What is a clumency? I will tell you later. She quickly replied before turning back to Quinn and asked, You are more expressionless than deaf, I mean green grass. You know that Daphne's expression is not because she is using a clumency, Quinn replied back. That is just her resting face. Let's move on. Why are you two here? Quinn wasn't having a good time, and right now, he didn't want to deal with anything. Especially with these two. The card isn't showing that I am in for consults, so why did you two come here? Ivy frowned before talking out the folded parchment and said, We bought you the Marauder's map. She was expecting a crack in Quinn's face, but he stayed expressionless. Ah, uh, I see. So you bought it. Good job, I guess replied Quinn. He stood up from his barstool and raised his hand for the map. Ivy didn't immediately hand the map over and asked, What are you going to do with the map? I hope you are not going to keep it. It is my dad's, and I am not going to let you keep it. I have no wish or desire to keep the map, Quinn replied. He didn't need it. I just want it for a couple of minutes, and you will get it back after that. But, what are you going to do with it? Ivy pressed on. She didn't care that this could get her in trouble. She wanted to know. You are smart. You will figure it out after I am done. He once again raised his hand to ask for the map. 
Rest assured, I won't damage it. Ivy's eyes wandered between Quinn's hand and face before she handed the map over. Take care of it, she softly said. Sure, came Quinn's reply as he stared at the parchment. Ivy sighed because Quinn's flat voice made it impossible to detect any vocal tone clues. It was like she was talking to a robot. Feel free to sit while I return in a while, Quinn offered without looking at them and entered his workshop leaving the two girls behind. So, what is a clumency? Hermione immediately asked. Sit down, Ivy sighed as she took a seat. This will take some time to explain. Scene break. On the other side of the glass wall, Quinn stood with both his hands on the table, his head hanging down and eyes closed. The reason he had asked for 10 minutes and not a minute to work on the map because he was busy groaning in his head. Trying to maintain his acclumency because of the stupidity he had done while he was under the influence was threatening to break his already thin spread emotional acclumency bounds. Why did I have to ask her to get the map? While Quinn's face was calm as a cucumber, inside it was a raging turmoil of emotions and regrets. Why me? His entire interaction with Ivy Potter after he had come out of the second vault had been a series of blunders that had now become a huge mistake. The first and biggest mistake was to confront Ivy Potter while she was polyjuiced into Daphne. This whole mess started at that point. If he was not under the influence at that time, Quinn would have ignored the thing and just turned a blind eye to the entire situation. Getting a Potter under his debt was outstanding in almost every situation. But this situation wasn't one of those. Hell, no, it is the worst situation, cried Quinn. Blackmail? Really, blackmail. What was I thinking? After that came the break-in, which Quinn was fine with. He would have done the same thing even without the influence from the second vault. He would have stunned them and then probably got them to owe him just like he did, but he would have done it much more calmly and did damage control by the time they were done. And, then was the bigger deal. Why did I have to tell them about the basilisk? Screamed Quinn internally. It was the mistake that could have and might still backfire. How am I going to answer if somebody asks me why didn't I tell professors? How am I going to answer this? Similarly, he was slumped because he had given them the chamber's location. Just these two things could ruin his peaceful life at Hogwarts. Quinn was snapped out of his self-loathing when he felt something. He looked down and saw that his hands were sinking into the wooden table because the entire tabletop had turned into sand. He clamped down on his acclumency to cut down his leaking emotions. Quinn raised his hands as the surrounding sand trickled down, and almost in a robotic and inorganic manner, bits and pieces of sand turned back into the wooden table as Quinn used his incomplete magic. After taking in a lot of deep breaths, Quinn calmed down his emotions and decided to end this, and after that, never to talk to anyone in the Golden Squad. He touched the parchment and softly spoke. I solemnly swear I am up to no good. The map came to life, and Quinn immediately found his position on the map by browsing through the spread parchment. He put his finger on his position, and within the next few seconds, the footsteps and name tag representing Quinn West on the map lightened until it was no longer visible. Done, said Quinn. Now, I am free from any tracking. This was the only good thing that came from this. If Quinn was under the radar of Ivy Potter, Hermione Granger, and with them the Golden Squad, then erasing himself from Marauder's map allowed him to roam unseen. He had recon, and they had nothing to track him. He could outrun them all day long, and they could never find him. Mischief managed? After he was done, Quinn moved back to his office. Scene break. Here you go. I am done were Quinn's first words while he returned the map to Ivy Potter. Your payment has been recorded and completed. The deal is finished. Thank you for doing business with me. Quinn skipped the part where he says to the clients to return if they had problems. He didn't want them to ever return. Ivy took the map from Quinn and gave it a close observation. Trying to figure out what Quinn did. You can look at it after you get out of here, said Quinn. Please, leave. Ivy and Hermione raised their heads and stared at Quinn, who stared back. The two parties stared at each other before Ivy nodded and stood up from her seat to leave. Hermione looked at Ivy and then Quinn before fidgeting a little and decided to go for it. Are you selling the notes for this year? Quinn, who wanted them to leave, clenched his hand under the table and nodded. He stood up, went to his workshop, and brought out two sets of notes. Quinn placed one set in front of Hermione and then eyed Ivy, do you want one? Ivy nodded but didn't say a single word. Neither Quinn nor Ivy wanted to speak to each other at this point in time. Same as last year, Quinn quoted the price. He didn't say anything about a discount because right now, it wouldn't even be funny. Hermione put down money for both sets and replied to Ivy, who looked at her with a quirked brow. I was always planning to buy these and well thought it won't harm in carrying money for yours as well. Hermione blushed under the gaze of the other two people in the room as she picked up the notes. Let's leave, muttered Ivy as she turned to the door and exited without saying a word. Hermione followed after her friend but not before throwing a quick glance at Quinn. After the door was closed, Quinn suddenly felt very tired. He wanted the school year to end. Scene break. I found it, Ivy yelled. She had the Marauder's map opened on her bed as she touched a spot on the map. What did you find? Asked Hermione. Looking up from the notes she had gotten today. I found what he did to the map, Ivy was frowning. Hermione stood up from her table and walked to Ivy's bed, and asked, what did he do? He erased himself from the map, spoke Ivy. I can't find him anywhere on the map. Yeah, that must be it. Hermione sat down on Ivy's bed and looked at the Marauder's map. She studied the map, which was one of the more fascinating works of magic she had seen. But right now, she had something else on her mind. 
So, you didn't ask him if he was down in the Chamber of Secrets, asked Hermione. Ivy stilled at the sudden question before answering the question, but she didn't look at Hermione. It doesn't matter, and I don't care. But Ivy knew why she didn't ask that particular question. The reason was simple. She didn't want it to be true. She didn't want to hear from Quinn's mouth that he was down in the Chamber of Secrets. Ivy Potter didn't want to hear that Quinn West saved her and her twin's life. He had threatened and blackmailed her twice. In both cases, he had implied that he would make her family's life hard. Her image of Quinn was anything but positive. She didn't know how she would feel if she was told from that same person's mouth that he was indeed the one to save her and Harry's life. Things were simple this way. As long as Quinn West was the bad guy in her mind, things would remain simple. And, Ivy Potter preferred simple after the events of this year. Scene break. The last few weeks had been tough. Quinn had found that if someone went from happy to the point of extreme giddiness to showing no expression, people would notice something was wrong. To combat that problem, Quinn had to force himself to show fake expressions. Which proved to be mighty difficult when he was so detached from his emotions. He even had to put fake emotions in his voice, which was difficult in its way. Quinn's magic was just too glitchy to keep illusions on his face the entire day, which made it necessary to fake his expression. To lessen this hardship, Quinn had chosen to spend the entirety of his in hiding. He would spend all his time in the Room of Requirement. Room of Requirements was the reason he had chosen to stay in Hogwarts rather than going home. He didn't know what was happening to him, and while his grandfather contacted Mr. Allen, it could be dangerous for Quinn to stay at home and risk losing control of his magic. His family could get injured by him, and Quinn didn't trust anyone other than Allen with his mind. Every day inside the Room of Requirements, Quinn would undo the bindings on his emotions, letting them and his rampant magic flow out. While letting his magic was painful, it was also stress relieving. Quinn binding his emotions all day wasn't good for his health. For the few minutes that Quinn let go of his emotions, he felt whole again. While it was painful, and Quinn struggled to force his magic to stay inside the entire time he let loose, it was the only time he felt whole. His exams weren't a problem because even with his current condition, Quinn could still perform magic above the asked level. He made sure that his results would be the same as last year because he didn't want anyone to know that he was suffering from an ailment. All his free time went in researching what had happened to him. But in the few weeks before the term end, he made little progress about his condition. So, when he deboarded the Hogwarts Express and saw his grandfather standing there, it was like a beacon of hope in the darkest of nights. Is he at home? Quinn skipped the greetings and directly asked. Yes, he is waiting, answered George. George had sent a magi fax to Quinn, telling him he had agreed to see Quinn and meet him the day Quinn returned home. Good, let's go home, Quinn said in the flat tone he had for weeks. George had prepared a winged horse pulled carriage because Quinn didn't trust himself with magical transportations like flu, apparition, or portkea. Scene break. Where is he? Quinn asked Elliot just as he entered the manor. His patience had run thin the second he saw the West Manor from the carriage. And usually, this would be considered rude Elliot knew what was happening to Quinn and answered. He is sitting in the reinforced training hall. Quinn nodded and beelined his way to the hall, which was reinforced just in case Quinn went ballistics. It was reinforced to withstand strong magic. He opened the door to the hall and saw the old man from which he had learned the magic that kept his magic at bay. The old man turned his face towards the door and then shifted his body when he saw Quinn. Oh, Quinn. It has been a while, hasn't it? Alan D. Baddeley had arrived. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Alan D. Baddeley, my favorite character, guess, who is back? Quinn West, MC, hey, why am I in the second place? I am always in the first place. Ivy Potter, complicated emotions, possessor of modified Marauder's map. Hermione Granger, bookworm, worried about exams. Chapter 69, Home, Potion, and Cure Quinn turned back and closed the door behind him. He nodded to George and Elliot, who were standing there as he closed the door. I will be back in a few. Turning back towards Alan, Quinn slowly walked to the chair in front of the old man and took a seat. Hello, Mr. Alan, greeted Quinn. Alan could see the clear signs of acclumency from Quinn's face. So, I hear you messed up, Alan spoke, and Quinn just stared at his mind arts teacher's usual, almost ever-present smile. He hadn't changed a single bit in the three years. Alan D. Baddeley was still the joyous old man who had a penchant for peeking into others' mind. I did. I really did. Quinn nodded in response. Alan was here to help him, so Quinn didn't gain anything from lying or hiding things. And, currently, with his acclumency operating full-time, he had a serious edge of logic in his thoughts. I want you to ready your bracelet and get ready to defend yourself. Quinn got straight to the point. This is what is happening with me. Ah, uh, yes. The rampaging magic I was told about. I think that is a good place to start. Alan brought his hands together and touched his focus bracelet with his other hand. Go ahead. I am ready. The two people in the room didn't waste any time catching up after three years of separation. Both knew that they could do it afterward. Quinn desperately wanted to know what was happening to him and solve it to get this crisis behind him. While Alan could see that Quinn wasn't having a good time. Okay, here I go. The next second, Alan immediately pulled up a transparent shield just as a spell was hurled towards him. Oh, that was close. He watched with keen attention as various activities of magic manifested into the room. There was nothing to be observed from the out-of-control magic. As the name suggested, it was out of control. 
After Alan was satisfied seeing this unusual sight, he turned his eyes to his young student, who had his eyes squeezed shut and struggle on his face. Immediately Alan sent a mental probe into Quinn's mind, and he was a little surprised to see that Quinn's shields were fully down. Right now, he was no different from a person without an occlumency shield. Alan dove into Quinn's mind and saw that the mindscape had changed in the last three years. Oh my, now that is a magnificent structure, Alan smiled as he saw the enormous building in front of him. Hogwarts Castle stood in all its magnificent glory. Even the surroundings were changed to look like the surroundings of the real Hogwarts. He built this in three years? Impressive. Alan was impressed because of the sheer size of the castle. He could tell that the castle was functioning memory storage and not a work in progress before a memory gateway initiation. But right now, he didn't have time to admire the structure, neither did he need to go through Quinn's memories. Let's go check his emotional status, said Alan, and instantly, he was not in the mindscape with the enormous castle. The space he arrived in was grey, with the color tending towards black rather than white. Inside the grey, there were dark distortion-like vortexes littered around the space. Well, with his magic out of control, it makes sense that his head is not right, noted Alan as he looked around. He loves magic after all. Alan was standing in Quinn's emotional representation. An experienced Legilimens or a Clumens could access their own or someone else's sentimental representation. You couldn't influence emotions from here, and this was just a place you could judge a person's emotions. Emotions were a complex concept that every mind arts user studied extensively. And if they were serious about learning about mind arts and the mysteries of the mind, then there would come a time in every mind art user when they would have to confront their emotions. The dark grayness in Quinn's emotional representation clearly showed that Quinn was in a darker state of mind, and the darker vortexes that he was struggling with some mental problems. Take Alan for an example. He was an avid advocate of mental health, and if anyone got the almost non-existent opportunity to get a look inside Alan's emotional representation, then they would find that it was a very light color of gray, a color very close to white. The lighter the color of the space, the better mental condition they were in. Alan took care of his mental condition and didn't have any delusions about himself. He confronted almost every issue about himself and got to the root of the problem. In doing that, he would attain closure and help his mental situation. A complete white emotional space was only present in infants, toddlers, or very young children. Any age above that would have different shades of grey because such was life, and they were sentimental beings, no person was perfect. The distortion-like vortexes were the real cause of problems, they were what messed up with Quinn's mind and, in turn, his magic. Removing his eyes from the grey space, Alan gazed at the bright and colourful arrangement in front of him. What Alan was seeing was a vast network of light orbs of various sizes connected to each other. The connections between them were of varying lengths and pulsed from time to time. Alan could think of every colour he knew, and he would find it in the bright and colourful network. There were so many connections that, to the naked eye, it was a complex network of lines and orbs. But, to a mind arts specialist like Alan, it was nothing but an open book. No matter how many times I see this, it never ceases to amaze me, murmured Alan as he looked at the complex network. This was the core of Quinn's emotions. Every emotion he had ever felt connected to each other in a complex network. This was a core part of Quinn West's personality. Personality was defined as the character sets of behaviors, cognitions, and emotional patterns that evolve from biological and environmental factors. Emotions heavily influenced a person's personality and attitude toward things. The more you experienced various situations, the more you form opinions, and with those opinions would come emotions regarding those experiences. Hmm, this isn't out of coordination, noticed Alan. There was nothing wrong with Quinn's emotional network. He isn't feeling unnatural bouts and spurts of emotions or nothing else. Well, Quinn did state that whatever was done to him came undone. Alan remembered the day when George West personally had come to his door to request his help. It was a shock to say the influential man contact him personally and not through someone else. George had told him that Quinn had requested his help. The initial information given to him was that Quinn's magic was out of control, and it was because he was under the influence of some kind of magic. Quinn stated when the magic came undone, his magic went out of control. This enough for now, said Alan. Scene break. When Alan came out of Quinn's mind, he spoke to his student. All right, you can stop, Quinn, spoke Alan. With a sudden, sharp, and erratic intake of air, Quinn clamped down on his occlumency. Immediately, all magic stopped, and Quinn went expressionless. Quinn's eyes remained closed for around a minute before he opened them and flatly asked, What is wrong with me? Other than a darker state of mind, I have found nothing wrong with your mind, replied Alan. Of course dash dot. But a shout from Quinn cut Alan's explanation. What? Immediately, Quinn's occlumency cracked slightly under the bout of anger. Did you just not see the rampant magic? How can you say that nothing is wrong with me? Rampant magic once again manifested in the room as the temperature rose. Alan sighed before he cast magic, and immediately Quinn's pupils dilated, and he calmed down. I am using mind magic on you to calm you down, spoke Alan. How are you feeling now? Calm down. Quinn nodded as he patched up his occlumency and detached his emotions from himself. Alan also retrieved his magic as Quinn brought himself under control. As I was saying, that there is nothing wrong with your emotions right now. They are functioning like a normal person, albeit a normal person under a lot of stress, Alan spoke in a calming voice, making sure that he didn't agitate Quinn. But, we have only started. 
There is a good chance that I might have missed something, so have patience. You have already been like this for a few weeks, you can wait for a little while. Quinn nodded in reply and patiently waited for Alan's instruction. I will need some memories, Alan said as he crossed his on his lap. I need to know what actually happened to you. Alan didn't even ask for Quinn's account of the entire situation and went straight for the memories. He was sure that his student would recognize that showing memories would be much more efficient and resourceful than Quinn telling him things using words. I expected that, replied Quinn. It took me days under this condition to create a collection of memories that will get you up to speed. Oh ho ho, you are prepared. That is nice, Alan remarked at the news from Quinn. I had weeks to think about this situation. Even though I wasn't able to get myself better, I did make sure that I had everything in hand for you. Alan tilted his head and asked, what would you have done if I had refused? Quinn mechanically shrugged, I wasn't thinking about that. I am sure that if you refused, grandfather would have brought in someone else. But, if I am being honest, I knew you would come. If Quinn didn't have his acclumency detaching his emotion from him, then he would have been smiling, but he couldn't even do that as his magic would have come alive and shot out fireworks into the air at the very least. Alan laughed at that statement, well, it turned out you were right. Here I am sitting in front of you. The old man rubbed his hands before saying, all right, show me those memories. Scene break. A mental representation of Quinn waited inside his mindscape with a book in hand. He looked up to see Alan manifest into the mindscape. Let's get started, said the representation of Alan as he walked to Quinn. He looked at the book in Quinn's hand and asked, is that the collection? Quinn nodded as he raised his hand. Put your hand on it. Alan followed, and without a break, put his hand on Quinn's memory book, and immediately the memories, snippets from the time Friar told him the riddle to the memories of a few days back, greeted Alan. It took Alan just over a minute to go through every single memory present in the compilation. It would have taken Quinn at least a couple of hours to do the same. Meet me outside, Alan said and promptly disappeared from Quinn's mind. When Quinn opened his eyes to return to the real world because right now, to do anything inside his mind took his entire concentration, and he couldn't operate in the real world and his mindscape at the same time. Alan sat in deep thought about what he had seen. The memories had given him a lot to think about, a lot of information to process. Well, did you find something? Quinn asked in impatience. Hmm, there were a lot of snippets, said Alan as he stood up. Quinn looked up at the standing man, waiting for the mind arts master to tell him some good news. I have some ideas. Give me some time to analyze. Alan walked to Quinn and put a hand on his head, ruffling his hair. Until then, sleep. Quinn was confused to hear it, but the next second, darkness took over him. Alan looked at his sleeping student and sighed. There were a lot of things to go over in Quinn's compilation. He needed some time to think those through, and he needed some hours for preparation, so he just put Quinn to sleep until then. Scene break. Quinn opened his eyes with a groan. He sat up on the bed and just stared forward towards the wall. Quinn frowned when the wall ahead wasn't part of his dorm room or his room in the West Manor. Where am I, he thought, and immediately he recalled what happened before he went to sleep. He was in the training hall sitting across Alan when he put his hand on his head, and then everything went black. He put me to sleep, didn't he, spoke Quinn. He ruefully smiled at the old man's actions. It fit Alan's personality, dropping him without warning. But then immediately, Quinn's eyes widened as he recalled he wasn't using his acclumency. Every morning since the accident, Quinn would wake up, and within a few seconds, he would be assaulted with pain that would function as a reminder to pull up his acclumency. Right now, there was no pain and, more importantly, no outbursts of magic. Good morning. Quinn moved his head to see Alan sitting in a chair with a book in his hand. A small table with tea and snacks stood beside him as he enjoyed the treats while reading his book. Did you cure me? Quinn asked with hope. For the first time in weeks, his voice wasn't flat and had emotion in it. Of course not, child. Alan smashed the hope within seconds. You should know better that your condition is much more serious to be cured overnight. Quinn closed his eyes in shattered hope and felt miserable that he wasn't cured but opened his eyes to ask the question. Then why isn't my magic acting up? What did you do? Currently, he was feeling as normal as he had ever been. His magic wasn't acting up, his emotions weren't detached, and he felt whole again. Alan sipped some tea from his cup before answering, I gave you a magic dampening potion 10 minutes before I woke you up. A magic dampening potion? Quinn exclaimed. He felt around for his magic and felt that his connection to it was weak. Something like that exists. If he had known that something like this existed, he would have used it a long time ago. Oh yes, magic dampeners exist. Alan chuckled and took a bit of a scone before continuing. They aren't used that much, so it is not strange that you haven't heard of them. Quinn didn't care that he wasn't aware of something like a magic dampening potion. He was just glad that something like this existed. Thank magic. At least with this, I won't have to keep using my acclumency to keep my magic under control. About that, Alan closed his book and looked at stared at Quinn. I am afraid that things aren't that simple. What do you mean? Quinn felt dread build up in his ribcage. The reason that the magic dampening potion isn't famous or widely known is that it is harmful to the drinker. Alan dropped a bomb on Quinn. What? W what do you mean it is harmful? If someone is put under the effects of magic dampening potion every day, all day, then their body starts to malfunction. Alan imparted grim knowledge to Quinn, who was under the effects of magic dampening potion. 
Tumors form in various parts of bodies, the immune system starts to weaken, multiple organ failures, degradation of senses, and overall the body starts to give up. Then why did you give it to me? Quinn screamed at his teacher, who just that he had given him a potion that could kill him. One dose of the potion won't do anything like that. You would need multiple doses every day for a certain period will cause what I was talking about. Alan waved his hand in dismissal as it wasn't a big deal. Then he dropped a bomb. But yet, you will be taking it every day. Quinn wanted to shout and scream, but he was just too much in shock to do so. He had just woken up, and this was the first thing he heard. He already knew how this day was framing out to be. Please, explain. Alan cleared his throat before starting, you can sense your magic, right? It is not completely cut off from you. Quinn nodded. The connection to his magic was weak, but it was there. The potion I gave you is a diluted recipe. It just weakens your connection and doesn't hamper it completely. Alan raised one finger in his right hand. This is the first thing that will reduce the negative effects of the potion. He raised another finger and continued, the dose you will be given will only work for maybe six to seven hours. So, the rest of the time, your magic will still be rampant, and well, you will have to use your acclumency. That also reduces the progress of negative effects of the potion. Alan smiled and finished, that way, I can keep giving you the potion for an extended period, and the effects won't creep on you like they are supposed to do when given the full treatment. Alan made air quotes as he said treatment. Wait, 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 Quinn raised his hand to speak up, all the things regarding the potion are fine, well, no, it is not fine, but let's put that aside for a second. I want to know the cure for this. I can keep taking the potion, but it will not help me cure anything. Alan put down his empty teacup and said, Quinn, there is nothing to cure with you. You are fine. There is nothing wrong with you. Alan enunciated every sentence to stress them. Quinn stared at the mind arts teacher with an expression that was a mix between shock, confusion, and disbelief. What do you mean there is nothing wrong with me? Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, what the hell is the old man talking about? Has he finally gone senile? Alan D. Baddeley, master of mind arts, I am not old, well I am, but I am not senile. Fiction only reader, it is a cliff suckers easy, eh, the word count was reached. Chapter 70, Aftermath, questions answered what do you mean there is nothing wrong with me? Quinn was stunned to hear Alan's statement. Here he had been having trouble controlling his magic. Whenever he set his magic free, it would go berserk and hurt him in the process. Just so that his magic doesn't go out of control, he had tortured himself and detached his emotions from himself. He had learned the very first day he had read upon the emotional aspect of acclumency that blocking his emotions for long periods was harmful. But, he still did it because it was the only way he could think. Now, the old man in front of him was telling Quinn that he had nothing wrong with him. What the hell do you mean by that? Alan sighed at his student and explained. Quinn, I diagnosed you while you slept. I didn't find anything wrong with you. Alan raised his hand when Quinn tried to speak up. I know your magic isn't under your control. But, that isn't a disease or injury. Then why is acting out and rampaging? Before I answer that, let's go back to the start, Alan suggested and put up his first question. Tell me, what do you think happened to you? I was clearly under the control of magic or curse. It all started when I fell unconscious in the vault, Quinn recalled the time when he returned to his dormitory. It lowered my inhibitions. I did plenty of things that I wouldn't do. Plus, vault made it so that I won't return to it for exploration. I was planning to return to the vault but changed my mind and didn't visit. I was clearly under some kind of mental curse. Quinn trailed off at the end and then raised his voice at Alan. Why in the bloody name of magic didn't acclumency work? I regularly spend time on that damn magic. Why didn't it work for months, months? Hmm, tell me, Quinn, what is your current system of acclumency defense? Alan asked a question from his student. He already knew the answer to the question, but was walking his student through the process so that he would arrive at the answer. It hasn't changed from the time we ended our lesson, said Quinn. He wondered why Alan was asking him the question. A shield layer built under a defense layer, with another set of the same configuration following under the first set. Correct, and I have to say that you have made noteworthy progress in strengthening your shields. They have grown quite a bit since the time I taught you. Alan gave Quinn praise on his progress before asking. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that right now, I am inside your mind? Definitely, Quinn replied almost immediately. He knew his teacher's personality. He had spent a couple of years under his tutelage, and he was sure that Alan was in his mind the entire time. Did you sense me entering? Or can you feel me operating legilimency right now? No, but where are you going with this? Asked Quinn. He wasn't following whatever Alan was trying to show him. Alan sighed before he said, Quinn, with your current system of acclumency, you won't be able to detect anything as long as they get past your shield. If someone or in this case something passes through your defenses, you will have no idea that they are inside. Your defenses will tell you that there is an incoming attack if they are strong enough, but once the attack is inside, your defenses won't do squat. Alan folded his hands on his lap and continued, Don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong with the system you are following. You can build your defenses until they are at my level. There is no limit there, but your system of acclumency defenses doesn't have any other feature beyond that. Your defenses won't do something that it wasn't designed for. Alan pointed at himself and said, If someone manages to break past my covering shields, that doesn't mean my defense is over. 
I have various fail-safes present beyond that to protect my mind. He pointed at Quinn and continued, You, on the other hand, have nothing other than your detection layers and shields. You have the castle and the manor inside, and you have sorted the memories in a way that even if someone gets past your defenses, they would have a mighty difficult time to get to the memory they are looking. And, while I was teaching you, we never went over the possibility of something like this happening. We worked on Legilimans breaking into your mind to get access to your memories. We never worked on something like this that would target you in such a way that would alter your personality. Alan paused and stated, you don't have a way to protect your mind from being manipulated like this. B but, I I worked hard on T this, Quinn was shocked to hear that his defenses were useless. He wasn't expecting to hear that after the time and effort he put on his acclimacy. I know you worked hard. Your defense aspect and your efficiency aspect have grown beyond what I had thought you would be able to accomplish at your current age. I can assure you that your progress is quick, and other than myself and some select individuals, your speed of progress is second to none. Then came the but of the sentence. But, your progress in the emotional aspect is lacking. While you are able to detach your emotions so that become nothing but a buzz at the back of your head, and that allowed you to keep your magic in check all this time. Alan had seen the memories, and with his level of legilimency, he didn't just watch the memories like a film and was able to feel what Quinn was feeling during his memories. You have done nothing to make sure that your emotions won't be manipulated. The one to blame here is time. You just didn't have enough time to devote to the emotional aspect while you learned other magic. When Alan said Quinn's progress was below himself and some other individuals, he didn't consider that Quinn devoted time not just to acclumency but various other fields of magic. Quinn had recovered from the reeling shock that his acclumency had failed him because he hadn't designed it sufficiently. Shields. Quinn said something that Alan wasn't able to hear, so he leaned forward and asked. Pardon, I didn't get that. Shields, you said my shields are strong. Why didn't they stop the magic from entering my mind? Even if my emotional aspect acclumency was lacking, my defense aspect was strong enough to block out an attack. Alan nodded to that question and gathered his thoughts to answer. Friar? Was that his name? Yes, Friar. The ghost who gave you the riddle said that another ghost had ceased to exist because of that vault. What did you think about that? That the vault was harmful to ghosts, what about it? I am not a ghost, said Quinn. He would have answered better if he was in another time, but right now, Quinn was defending his acclumency. All right, what are ghosts? asked Alan. A ghost is the imprint of the soul of a once living magical, and as such, a type of spirit. These fleshless spirits are either afraid of death or have some extremely potent connection to the locations they haunt. Quinn gave him the textbook definition of a ghost. Alan smiled as the words were right there. Exactly, they are imprints of souls. Imprints of souls have similar properties as actual souls. You get what I am talking, right? Quinn gave it a thought, and after some time, he exhaled. The curse was soul-based. Is that what you are talking about? Alan made a face that said, kind of, but not really. The curse was emotion-based, but I can safely conclude that the curse definitely had a soul aspect. It might as well have been the entry point as after that your neither your mind nor soul had no defense for your emotions. Alan gazed at Quinn as he thought about how to explain it to his student. Emotions are connected to both mind and soul. Some believe that it might even be connected to the body as negative emotional states can affect physical output. But, emotions are definitely connected to mind and soul. Mind connection, you already know, and the existence of ghosts show conclusive proof of the soul connection. They remained in the mortal world because they had unfinished business, whether in the form of fear, guilt, regrets, or overt attachment to the material world who refused to move on to the next dimension. The choice to come back as a ghost was emotionally based. You never noticed something was wrong with you the entire time the curse was active. You made decisions and acted in ways that you wouldn't have. A lot of things should have triggered some suspicion inside you, but it never did. Not once did you think that there was something wrong with you. All of this was because the curse was acting on your emotions and, in turn, your personality. It attacked from two sources, both closely connected to magic, mind and soul. Quinn just grabbed his head and groaned. He was regretting the decision to dive into the second vault. What about my magic rampaging out? Quinn questioned. How is that connected to my magic? What about the changes the curse bought to my magic before it broke? About that, I have no idea how did the curse, if we can even call it that at this point, increased the capacity of your magic, but I can tell you that the increase in control was because emotion and will is an essential aspect to magic. The curse definitely brought your emotions close to your magic. Your magic responded to your emotions better than ever while you were under its influence. A magical's emotional state can affect their inherent abilities. For instance, an agent of the Statute of Secrecy Task Force was said to have produced better results with their in charm after channeling the goodwill they received from innkeepers they met on their travels into their spellcasting. While in service, Gareth Greengrass, a senior researcher in the Department of Mysteries, at one point, documented over 700 instances of spells being cast in anger. He found they were all more powerful than even the casters themselves had thought themselves capable of producing. The curse targeted your emotions with cardinal sins, or the capital vices, or the seven deadly sins. Quinn collapsed back into his bed, and while gazing at the ceiling, he asked, do continue. It triggered your emotions when you felt things that were even remotely in connection to the cardinal sins, Alan listed all the seven sins. Pride. Greed. Envy. Sloth. Wrath. Gluttony. Lust. 
Let's talk some examples of how the curse affected you, spoke Alan as he got up from his chair and walked around Quinn's bed. First, let's take an example of how it amplified your emotions from something small to an exaggerated state. Your first duel in that dueling club of yours. The mention of the event brought Quinn's memory of the duel against Miles Bletchley to the surface. You felt a little insulted by the way he looked at you. Tell me, what would you have done if you had another chance and weren't influenced by the curse? Quinn didn't have to think much about it, and he answered, a single disarming spell and end the duel within seconds. I would have ended the duel so fast that he wouldn't have a chance to even twitch a muscle, but I wouldn't have humiliated him by not even drawing my wand. That was too flashy for me. Quinn could hear Alan's footsteps as he walked around, that was wrath. He insulted you, and that triggered wrath. Your opponent just looked at you funny, and I think you decided to humiliate him even before the nasty spells he shot. I guess you are right, Quinn thought about the times he had been angry in the last few months. Some regrettable decisions flashed through his mind. Next, let's move on to the times where the curse took advantage of your body to take effect, Alan spoke, moving on to the next observation. If Quinn could see his teacher's face, he would have found a huge shit-eating grin on the old man's face. Body? When did the curse affect my body? Quinn wasn't sure there were changes to his body. Quinn was sure that his body wasn't touched by the curse. I am talking about puberty, Quinn. Quinn froze in his bed, and he immediately knew Alan was talking about lust. I am sure that you wouldn't have included those memories in the memory package, but you were working with logical thinking that spanned for days on end. So, a lot of those ended up in there. Alan laughed for a while before continuing. Lust triggered in short, but many bursts, and that was because of your hormones. You were so affected by it because you started to feel attracted to the fairer sex. Alan chuckled at the embarrassment his student was feeling. Lust just took over from that point on. I really saw youth in there. Quinn had spanked the monkey, jacked the beanstalk, auditioned with his hand puppet, charmed the snake, took the dog out for a walk, or wanked, twice a day without fail. Now laying in his bed, Quinn remembered the times he had been doing something and just ended up staring at the passing by girls. Then there was the incident with Daphne. Damn it, why did I have to say that Daphne? Quinn mushed his face into the pillow. Lust might have been the most enjoyable, but just like others, it made him do things he regretted. Let's move on, please. A muffled shout from Quinn made Alan laugh. All right, let's move on to the case where Curse made sure that you won't go back to the antechamber. Only one sin kept you away from the vault. Quinn gritted his teeth and almost snarled, sloth. Yes, sloth. Alan had gone through Quinn's memories, and the one sin that was as far away from Quinn was the sin of sloth. Quinn West was a busy person. He had magic to learn, and Quinn made sure to spend every productive minute of his time learning magic. So, sloth was Quinn's mortal enemy. Surprisingly, it didn't affect you that much, didn't it? Except making sure that you didn't go to the antechamber, skipping your morning runs, and the frequent short flashes of zoning out, all you got was becoming extremely rowdy if you were awake past your bedtime. Quinn didn't say anything because it was true. The reason Sloth didn't take root inside Quinn was because. Greed didn't let me be lazy, said Quinn as he stood up from the bed. The talk about Sloth made him want to get away from the bed. Right, about that. I never understood why you spent that much time in the library. I know you like to learn, but the time you spent in the library was unusually lengthy. I, for a fact, know that you like to use magic as much as you like to read about it, asked Alan as he watched Quinn stand up from the bed and stretch. Quinn spoke while he stretched his body. I had tricked a professor into signing a pass to the restricted section of the library. The problem was that there is a curse on the position of the defense against dark arts position. No professor lasts more than a year. I think it has been going on for decades. The teacher I tricked was the defense against dark arts professor. A strange flash passed through Alan's eyes as Quinn mentioned the defense against dark arts professor. I was sure that the professor would be gone by the end of the year, which meant that pass would only last for a year. So, I had to make sure to squeeze the maximum out of the one school year I had. Quinn made eye contact with Alan and continued. My magic was increasing by the day, and my control was getting better, so the decision I made was to spend all my time in the library. Now that you mentioned the sins, I think greed was the most prominent sin out of all seven. It was always present in the back of my head, guiding me to learn more and more. Quinn sighed as he leaned against a wall with his hands behind his back. Sitting in that library made you happy, and that was because greed made it such. Your greed for knowledge was fulfilled while you stayed in the library, and it affected your emotions, making you happy, Alan made some conclusions out from the knowledge he had. Quinn nodded, but then he pushed away from the wall and point blank asked. Enough of this, tell me what had happened to my magic. Alan stopped his walk and turned to face Quinn. The two stared at each other for a moment before Alan spoke up. Your mind, soul, and magic are fine. They don't have anything wrong with them. The problem is that while the curse was active, it increased your capacity and focus, but the way it was achieved was not natural, or should I say the process was artificial. Quinn felt his heart beat faster as Alan continued to speak. I don't think that curse was supposed to break down. I don't know what it was designed to achieve, but it wasn't meant to break down in the middle like it did in your case. With my knowledge, it was meant to go until the end, whatever the end was. All of this was what Alan had been able to find out from Quinn's memories and an entire night of diagnostics on Quinn while he slept. The curse had total control over your focus abilities as it was raising it artificially. 
So when it came undone, your bond to your magic which was being raised artificially broke down and with it everything you had worked hard to establish. Alan pursed his lips when he saw the despair on Quinn's face. He knew that Quinn had worked hard to build his control since he was five years old. But now, it was all gone. Oh okay. Mr. Allen, this isn't helping me, Quinn's voice had a shakiness and desperation in his voice. W what does this mean? Alan knew what was coming, but he had to continue. Your focus ability is gone completely, Quinn, and the reason your magic is lashing out is that it was had been artificially raised. You weren't meant to gain that much magic in that short amount of time. Your own magic is rejecting itself and is trying to get out. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, no control over his magic. Alan D. Baddeley, teacher, breaker of bad news. Fiction only reader, author, don't worry, things will be fixed in the next chapter. I hope nobody reads this because I am kind of building tension here, but I know what happens when I do it. This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below.